Okay, uh, assuming that you can hear me, I'd like to, to welcome you all to this um, event, this discussion of the, the Nuremberg Trials, to welcome you on behalf of the Royal Irish uh, Academy. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, members of staff of the, of the Royal Irish Academy who've helped organize this event, particularly Vanessa Carswell, um, Pauline McNamara and uh, Sharon O'Connor. And above all else, I'd like to, uh, to thank our speakers for uh, agreeing to participate uh, in this uh, discussion. So, you know, the, the Nuremberg, the Nuremberg Trials historical event, obviously this is um, an anniversary discussion uh, of, that, uh, of, that, of that event. And clearly, there's, there's an important historical uh, dimension to, to today's discussions, but it's not just about history, it's about um, the legacy, the contemporary legacy of the Nuremberg Trials and the lessons for today. So the idea of the, uh, the symposium, the seminar, whatever you want to call it, is to examine uh, the Nuremberg Trials from a, uh, you know, a, a number of different perspectives, uh, and, and that kind of aim is reflected in uh, the multidisciplinary uh, nature of uh, the panel that we've uh, put together. Okay, the only thing I, I have to do at this stage is to hand you over to um, the chair of today's proceedings. Um, uh, the event is going to be chaired by Judge uh, Shifra O'Leary. Uh, judge O'Leary is a judge at the European Court of uh, Human Rights and previously uh, she worked at the Court of Justice of the European Union. She's also been uh, a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges for a number of years. So, so I'm going to hand you over to, to, to uh, Judge O'Leary to, to, to begin uh, to, to today's event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. And I join you in thanking uh, the Royal Irish Academy uh, and all of the organizers who I'll come back to at the end of the session. Um, we have over 350 people registered for today's events. And as you can see, we're well over 130 participants for the time being. Uh, no doubt more people will join us during the course of the afternoon. My first task today is to introduce our keynote speaker, Philippe Sands. And it is an enormous pleasure to do so. Philippe, as many of you know, is a Franco-British barrister at Matrix Chambers and a professor at University College London. And I cannot do justice in a few moments, in the few moments available to me, to the depth and range of his professional work. Aside from the two professions just mentioned, which for both, most people are full-time professions, he's also a writer, not least of East West Street, which he will touch on during the course of his presentation, and a commentator, engaging with topics extending from British engagement with the European Convention of Human Rights, obviously a topic close to my professional heart, to the topic of ecocide, namely current efforts to recognize destruction of the natural environment as an international crime, a topic I think he will also mention during the course of the afternoon. For any judge or jurist, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce someone whose legal engagements have stretched from Pinochet to the Chagos Islands and on to the Rohingya. In his epilogue in East West Street, he lists the criminal justice legacy of the Nuremberg trials and the lawyers and scholars who contributed to that legacy. And it will not have escaped the audience's attention that although though today we gather to discuss the various legacies of the Nuremberg trials from a multidisciplinary perspective, as Jeff has emphasized, evidence of how real the legal legacy was in full view just over a week ago, because on the 8th of June, the Appeals Chamber of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals upheld the 2017 conviction of Ratko Mladic for genocide, crimes against humanity, and violations of the laws or customs of war for four joint criminal enterprises, not least the Srebrenica massacre. Now, before passing the floor to Philippe, I'm obliged as chair to mention just some technical points. The audience was invited to submit written questions in advance, and of the 350 registered, I thank the one registered uh, participant who did submit a written question, but the Q&A function will be operational during the course of the afternoon, and with the assistance of Jeff Roberts, I will be feeding questions to the panel and the keynote speaker. Now, as a speaker uh, since the COVID pandemic on many different webinars, could I ask you to submit questions which are neat, and clear, 
And now, while this seems very obvious, in fact, it's absolutely essential because you're not questioning uh, the person who's going to answer your question directly. If the question isn't clear, there is often a Chinese whispers effect uh, and your message may be lost in translation. Uh, the Royal Irish Academy tested earlier on today the subtitle facility, but it was deemed of insufficient quality to make it operational. So I apologize to anyone who was looking forward to using that facility. As you have been notified, the session is being recorded. The audience members will be, not be visible uh, in the recording and the recording will be made available afterwards on the website. During the course of the, of the discussion, the panel members and the keynote speaker will only have their videos uh, and mic on when they are actually uh, speaking. So don't worry if you see us appear and disappear off the screen uh, at various different times. Turning back to Professor Sands from Nuremberg, back to East West Street, the legacy for modern international criminal justice and looking to the future. You have both the floor and I can guarantee you a captive audience. Thank you so much, Judge O'Leary, and thank you to the Royal Irish Academy. Um, I think my relationship with Ireland is well known. I never miss an opportunity to visit. I'm very sorry not to be with you in person as we hoped, but uh, I hope to be back very soon. I was supposed to be at Dalkey and at Boris, um, but sadly with COVID in these difficult times, that did not prove possible. I do hope everyone is well uh, and safe and hopefully there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I'm very honored to be on this uh, session with such distinguished uh, co-panelists, um, some of whom I know very well. It's a real pleasure to be back with them. And to those who I don't know so well, it's also a great pleasure to make your, your acquaintance in this way. And I'm looking forward uh, to listening to the whole thing and then uh, joining in, in the conversation uh, after the um, full panel has spoken. Um, uh, my theme today is really about the place of the individual in the making of the trials. There are so many different ways one can address the question of the legacy of Nuremberg. It's very simple that in my world and anyone who works in any way in international criminal law, all roads lead to Nuremberg. If there had not been a Nuremberg trial starting on the 20th of November 1945, we would not have had what followed. We would not have had a Yugoslavia tribunal or a Rwanda tribunal or international criminal court or a convention uh, on the prevention and punishment of genocide and proceedings at the International Court of Justice under that convention. We may well have had something else, um, and it's a matter of um, speculation as to what that might have been. But I think what anyone involved in those later proceedings knows with almost absolute certainty is that the legacy of Nuremberg is felt in every single one of those proceedings and in so many more in which other panelists have been involved either professionally or, or intellectually uh, or, or in other ways. It, it's an extraordinary uh, legacy. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes about the legacy and do so in part with a personal uh, perspective. Um, if I'm asked, which I am often asked, what is the significance of Nuremberg today? I, I, I have found that I've gone back to a conversation that I had in Washington in November 2019. It was about a month before proceedings at the International Court of Justice, in which my good friend uh, Bill Shabas and I were on opposite sides, um, but committed absolutely to the rule of law, which is the beauty of the international legal system, uh, a, a tradition well known uh, in the Irish legal system uh, also. And I was in Washington. Uh, and I was on a panel with a very dear friend of mine, who some of you will know by reputation and some of you may know in person, Judge Thomas Bergenthal, who was the American judge at the International Court of Justice in uh, The Hague for, for many years. Um, but, but what is less well known is that as a small boy, age 10, Tom Bergenthal was at Auschwitz. And Tom Bergenthal was uh, under the care of a man called Joseph Mengele, who you will know well. He was one of the boys who was being uh, looked after, shall we say, uh, by Dr. Mengele. And in the panel, Tom turned to me at one point and said, 
apropos the conversation about the coming proceedings in the interstate case between the Gambia and Myanmar, uh, which I want to credit Myanmar's participation as a very significant moment and a positive uh, contribution. Um, Tom Bergenthal said, can you imagine, Philippe, if there had been a genocide convention in 1944 when I was at Auschwitz, or if there had been an international court, a court of justice or an international criminal court, at which a faraway country could have brought proceedings against Germany in relation to the mistreatment that I and so many of my friends and family were subjected to. And, and I thought the conversation that we then proceeded to have about that theme was significant because it highlights a number of things. But one of the things that it highlights is how recent and how fragile are the political, diplomatic and legal developments that gave rise to the Nuremberg moment. That moment was constructed with remarkable speed in the summer of 1945. There were ideas about um, creating some sort of international uh, criminal or domestic criminal proceedings to try uh, senior Nazis, but that really was only actioned from the beginning of 1945. And in very short order, the Allies, led by the United States and the United Kingdom, but with many other countries uh, involved, played an absolutely uh, key role in drafting a, stat a charter and a statute. And they really had to start with a blank piece of paper. Um, there was no crime of genocide. There was no such thing as crimes against humanity. There was no such thing as the crime of aggression as it now is, um, crimes against peace as they then were at Nuremberg. And I've often thought about the group of individuals who started with a blank sheet of paper and had to construct something. Um, and that is what caused me in writing East West Street to home in on individual stories. I first came across the Nuremberg trial when I was a student of international law for the first time. That was in 1980, 1981 at a British university. I was taught by a wonderful man, Robert Jennings, a Yorkshireman, uh, who went on to become the British judge at the International Court of Justice. And he did make a passing reference to Nuremberg. He didn't talk about the detail, there wasn't time. He talked about the principles, the new crimes that were established, the idea that a head of state or a leader could no longer claim immunity from the jurisdiction of an international criminal procedure and the proceedings uh, as they were invented with everything from the rights of defendants to simultaneous interpretation and a myriad of other things uh, that were developed. That was done in very, very short order. And one of the things that's remarkable, and I'm sure we'll hear more about in the course of today, is the extent to which those developments in the summer of 1945 uh, have informed so very deeply what has followed the drafters of the statutes of the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, the drafters of the International Criminal Court, of the internationalized criminal tribunals, will all report to you that the inspiration was very largely the Nuremberg trial and of course the Tokyo trials uh, that uh, followed. When I first learned about Nuremberg, I did so as a law student. Uh, and one of the things about law teaching is that it tends to focus on the big picture and not get into the micro, uh, not get into the weeds and the details. And one of the things that I've come to learn in my own life, uh, in large part as a practitioner, is that the details really matter. Individuals matter, particular moments in proceedings, particular moments in drafting pleadings, particular moments in drafting a judgment or a statute where individual factors come into play uh, enormously uh, significantly. Just by way of parentheses, this is not about Nuremberg, but right now I'm finishing uh, a new book, uh, which touches on something that Judge O'Leary mentioned, the uh, case concerning the Chagos Archipelago, the last British colony in Africa, uh, which is claimed by the United Kingdom today, despite uh, successive decisions by international courts, making clear the United Kingdom has no rights uh, 
over the British Indian Ocean Territory, as the UK calls it, the Chagos Archipelago, as Mauritius and the rest of the world uh, calls it. And it was astonishing to discover that in the history of that case, the famous resolution that was the basis of the International Court's famous advisory opinion in February 2019 on the decolonization of Mauritius and who Chagos belonged to, the president of the General Assembly who presided over the adoption of Resolution 1514 on the principle of self-determination, today the right of self-determination, was a very well-known Irish diplomat, Frederick Bowen, um, who will be known to many of you, not only for his life, but for the life of his remarkable daughter, the poet Even Bowen, whose uh, poem, What is a Colony, in fact, opens my book on Chagos. And I went back and explored the role that Frederick Boland had made uh, in fashioning a resolution, 1514, that gave rise to the right of self-determination. And the crucial role he played as an individual, informed deeply by his own experiences growing up in Ireland, which had been, of course, a colony of the United Kingdom, uh, and a deeply personal sense of what it meant. And the more I get into the question of legacies about the making of international legal orders, the more I've come to understand that individual judges, individual negotiators, individual drafters, individual counsel, individual defendants play an absolutely crucial role in what happens. So I want to step back a little bit, if you like, from the big picture. We know the fundamental principles that Nuremberg established the key principles, including absence of immunity, fair trial, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to rehearse that. I want to talk a little bit more about what I learned in diving deep into the Nuremberg trials in writing East West Street, because it surprised me. I found things that I had not expected. I found points of detail uh, that have not been focused on, but most of all, I came across themes which inform my own working life today in a very deep way. So there is a disconnect, if you like, between the Nuremberg trial of the treatises of the academic articles and the Nuremberg trial that I discovered by coming to know some of the participants and some of the children of the participants of those proceedings who engaged with the trial in so many different ways. And what I came to understand was that the eventual and final outcome of that proceeding was deeply informed by the individual participants, by the individual judges with their different backgrounds, by the individual prosecutors. I'm thinking here, not just of Robert Jackson, who is of course so very well known, but perhaps more significantly of the deputy British prosecutor, David Maxwell Fife, who played an absolutely crucial role in the spring of 1946, when the concept of genocide integrated into the indictment by Raphael Lemkin, who had founded the word, made its way suddenly back into the trial through a series of relations between David Maxwell Fife and Raphael Lemkin. What would have happened I've often asked myself subsequently if Raphael Lemkin had not lobbied David Maxwell Fife in his cross-examination of the former German Foreign Minister von Neurath and brought genocide back into the trial. It informed the thinking of other prosecutors later on, including the British prosecutor Hartley Shawcross, who contrary to the views of his own legal advisor, Hirsch Lauterpacht, the Huell Professor of International Law at Cambridge University, who was virulently against the concept of genocide, fearing that it would replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the group, something which I fear may have happened, Shawcross overrode him. And he did so with the support of David Maxwell Fife. And that meant that when the judgment came down with no mention of the concept of genocide, there was at least British political support for Lemkin's idea in favor of a genocide convention in some quarters, opposition in other quarters. But from Shawcross and from Maxwell Fife, 
very strong support for the work of Lemkin. And so those personal relations that were built up during the proceedings, of which nothing much, frankly, is written, played a very key role in what came subsequently. The individual defendants also obviously had an absolutely crucial role to play. The one that I have been most interested in is Hans Frank. And having dived deeply into this character of Hans Frank, it continues, frankly, to remain a mystery for me as how a man of such education and culture and intellectual ability got enmeshed in the horrors in which he got enmeshed as governor general of Nazi occupied Poland. I've come to know his son very well, Nicholas Frank. Indeed, rather astonishingly, Nicholas has become a very close friend of mine. And through the material he has given me, I've come to understand what it was for a defendant to go through that trial and what it was for the families of defendants to go through that trial. I had grown up in the Nuremberg story, if you like, on one side of the tale, my mother's side. She had been uh, a hidden child in German-occupied Paris from 1940 to 1944, separated from her parents. She and her parents lost vast numbers of their own families. And so I'd grown up in a family knowing what it meant to be, if you like, on the victim side, but I'd never turned my mind to what it meant to be on the perpetrator side. And in getting to know Nicholas Frank, I came to understand for the first time the enormity of what it means to grow up as a child. Nicholas was seven in 1946 when his father was hanged at Nuremberg. He'd seen him a few days before his hanging. And he lives with the burden of being the son of a man who was hanged for the murder of four million human beings, three million Jews, and a million Poles, and that burden is enormous. I've also come to understand, however, in writing East West Street and getting to know Nicholas Frank, how the fact of the trial at Nuremberg and his father's involvement in it, his participation in it, has helped the Frank family in a way to come to terms with what their predecessor did. By contrast, Nicholas introduced me to a friend of his, the son of his father's deputy, Otto von Wechter. And Otto von Wechter was also indicted for crimes against humanity and for genocide, for mass murder, but he was never caught. And so he was never subjected to any sort of trial, not international, not domestic. And the absence of a trial has created a different kind of space for the Wechter family, a space of silence, a space in which it's possible to say that the forebear died an innocent man not convicted by any court, national or international. And that has caused me to reflect further on the legacy of these trials for individual families, because of course, great mass of families did not live through trials like uh, Nuremberg or Tokyo or the, the domestic proceedings that took place in uh, many of the German occupied countries, including in particular Poland uh, and uh, Holland. So getting to know through their children, some of the defendants or non-defendants have given me a different uh, perception about the function of an international criminal proceeding like the Nuremberg uh, trial. I've also come to know, uh, obviously not any of the judges, but some of those who were closest to the judges. Um, one of the most remarkable people I have come across, one of the last people alive who was a participant in the trial, um, a Frenchman, Yves Begbeder. And Yves Begbeder was the assistant to the French judge, Henri Donadieu de Vabre. Uh, in fact, he was also his nephew. Um, and he told me rather sweetly one day how it was he came to be involved as a 21 year old in the workings of the Nuremberg trial, a procedure he sat in for their entirety, uh, pretty much. Um, Yves Begbeder uh, received a phone call from his uh, uncle, uh, who was a distinguished professor of criminal law at the University of Paris in the spring of 1945. Would you like to spend uh, a few months working with me in Nuremberg uh, 
as my legal assistant. Eve had just graduated uh, as a, a student uh, at the Sorbonne in law. And he said, no, I've got no interest. I'd rather stay in Paris. The war's over. I want to have a good time. Uh, it was his aunt who persuaded him, uh, Professor Donald Dudevalva's wife, that it would be useful for him to spend a year in Germany. Uh, when I asked him whether he appreciated uh, that, he said, actually, I did, because in Nuremberg, they had things we didn't have in Paris. They had chocolate and they had oranges brought in by the Americans. But Yves Begbeder also was able to witness firsthand a trial and to speak to someone who was able to speak from the inside, how it went out, is a truly remarkable thing. But equally remarkable was what Yves Begbeder did not know. The trial was from 1945 to 1946. Uh, the 75th anniversary of the judgment comes up uh, on the 1st of October uh, this year. And no doubt there will be many events like this one uh, to mark that trial. And during one of our conversations, it would have been about 2014, 2015, so 70 years after the trial, I said to Eve over the telephone, what about your uh, uncle's relationship with Hans Frank? And there was a silence on the end of the telephone. And I said, Eve, are you there? He said, yes, 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 but I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean my uncle's relationship with Hans Frank? And I explained to him how I'd come across some documents which showed that in the summer of 1935, Donald de Vabre, professor in Paris, had been invited to uh, Germany, to Berlin, to give a lecture to the German Academy of Law run by Hans Frank, who was the president, on ideas in future international criminal justice. And Donald de Vabre accepted to give the lecture, traveled to Berlin, and delivered a lecture on the idea of an international criminal court. Hans Frank responded to the lecture with a riposte of his own. What a ridiculous idea. It will never happen. Ten years later, they found themselves sitting in the same room, courtroom 600, which is well worth a visit, a remarkable space. And um, I have often wondered uh, whether their eyes met on that first day when the trial opened, as Donadieu entered the room, sat down, sat opposite uh, Hans Frank and whether they looked each other in the eye and remembered the dinner they had had together in Berlin just 10 years earlier. Yves Begbeder, the nephew, was totally astonished. He had absolutely no idea. He says, it can't be true. My uncle never said anything to me about this. I didn't realize that he knew Hans Frank. What proof do you have? And I had uh, Donadieu's lecture and I had a photograph of him delivering that lecture and I had the speech given by Frank in response to the ideas uh, proposed by Donadieu de Vabre. And Yves was absolutely astonished by that. But he was even more astonished by something else that he did not know. Of the four judges who voted on the penalty to hand down on Hans Frank for the crimes he was found to have been committed. He was the only one of the four to vote against the death penalty, rather uh, establishing support for the proposition that it's very hard to sentence to death someone you have previously had dinner with on a social or professional occasion as the two men had 10 years earlier. That kind of information about the relations between two men, defendant and judge, has transformed the way I think about the proceedings at Nuremberg. And I think we do need to spend rather more time looking at the dynamics within the judges, within the prosecution team, and within the defense team on the ways in which the proceedings were conducted. Nuremberg was very different from how international justice is done today, and it was very different from how domestic justice is done in countries like Ireland and many other countries. I came to know also um, the daughter of Geoffrey Lawrence, uh, who was the presiding judge, the British judge. And she introduced me uh, to a grandson of the Lawrences. And I went and spent time uh, at Lawrence home uh, just outside uh, London, where uh, I was shown four volumes of a scrapbook kept 
by Lord Justice Lawrence's wife, Marjorie, throughout the trial. And in the scrapbook was a menu, uh, a dinner menu, towards the end of the trial to celebrate or to mark the departure of one of the prosecutors. And everyone who had attended the dinner had signed on the back of the menu and written a little note. And it became apparent from this document uh, that the prosecutors and the judges had no compunction about hanging out together, socializing together and talking together. This is now all relatively well established. And so the reality of the Nuremberg trials, I think, um, is rather different from the pedestal uh, upon which uh, it has been placed uh, with the benefit of history. And I think it is useful sometimes to bring us back down to the realities. Let me say a little bit uh, as I come to the concluding parts uh, of what I have to say in these introductory uh, words on the legacy of the themes for the future of the Nuremberg trial. I've made the point and I've written on it extensively in other places that in the field of international criminal justice and in international law more generally where matters of criminality arise, all roads lead to Nuremberg. And that is a positive thing. There are problems obviously with the Nuremberg Charter and the Nuremberg Statute and the practice. It's a matter of continuing mystery to me as to how it could be that the English bar passed a rule in advance of the Nuremberg trial, prohibiting any member of the English bar from acting as counsel for the defense. I have not been able to ascertain how that came about. It troubled me when I first find out about it. It troubles me still today. Uh, and there are a myriad of aspects of the Nuremberg trial, which I think, not that one, have been taken forward in ways that are problematic. And I'm just going to mention uh, three or four of them. Firstly, the fact that one might call lopsided justice. Uh, there's no question that um, Nuremberg was a form of victor's justice. It targeted Germans and of course Austrians who were treated as Germans, but it left others uh, unscathed. It did not apply to other allies of Germany and there were no defendants in the international military tribunal from many of Germany's allies who had assisted and participated and cooperated uh, across the entirety uh, of Europe. Nor was there any place uh, amongst the defendants for those who had perpetrated crimes on the side of uh, the allies. And I think that has left a legacy which is problematic. It has in effect legitimated the idea that international criminal justice is for the vanquished and the weak. Um, it, it, it evokes the idea of, of Balzac, that the law is like a spider's web. It catches the small and the inconsequential, but the bigger flies somehow pass through or manage to escape. And I can't help but imagine, as I look on the website of the International Criminal Court today, 75 years later, and see that of the 30 people who have been indicted before the International Criminal Court, every single one of them is Black or African. And that strikes me as deeply problematic. Blacks and Africans do not have a monopoly on international criminality. We know that. How can it then be that 20 years after it began to function, the International Criminal Court operates in a way that only a particular category of individuals have been subjected to its form of justice? And I think it's a taking forward, if you like, of the lopsided justice that was in a sense legitimated. And this brings me to a second point, and that is the relationship between law and politics. Um, uh, the more you dive into the Nuremberg trial, the International Military Tribunal, the more you recognize the deep and close and intimate interplay between political objectives and legal practices, the way in which the defendants were identified, the way in which the crimes were created and cast, the way in which um, one passed over the concern of some that 
crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity didn't exist in September 1939. I've often wondered how Hans Frank must have felt when he read the indictment for the first time and saw that he didn't been indicted for matters that frankly had been invented after the fact to capture him and others like him for the acts in which they had been involved. And it, it must also be recognized that going forward on matters like Yugoslavia, on matters like Rwanda, on matters before the International Criminal Court, politics of course plays a very big role in the identification of defendants, in the determination of which cases uh, to go with. To give one very simple example, it remains a matter of deep concern to me that there have been no indictments in relation to one of the countries which has been a party to the statute for nearly 20 years, Afghanistan, on which crimes have been committed on all sides. Why has that happened? How can it be that allegations in relation to, for example, the British or the Americans, which plainly fall within the jurisdiction of the court, have not to this point, it may change, but have not to this point been the subject of uh, indictments? The answer, of course, is politics. Uh, that the law does not operate in a vacuum, it is deeply informed by political considerations. And that, I think, informs uh, our view on the legacy. The third point that I would make is the approach taken to the interpretation of texts. And there is marvellous work that has been done on the um, way in which uh, statutory language was interpreted back in 1945-46, uh, and how it is interpreted uh, today. The most famous example, of course, is the interpretation uh, by the judges of Nuremberg uh, of a um, semicolon being replaced um, by a comma, which had the effect of excluding from the jurisdiction uh, of the Nuremberg proceedings at the IMT um, of certain international crimes that occurred before war had broken out on the 1st of September 1939. And again, I think that in the most subtle of ways, approaches to textual interpretation that were picked up in that uh, original uh, proceedings in 45-46 inform our way of thinking uh, today uh, in, in, in how we uh, proceed. Uh, the same may be said in terms of legal method uh, and practice. Uh, I've talked to innumerable prosecutors who explain to me how before the various international and internationalized criminal proceedings of today, there are of course a multitude of differences from what came at Nuremberg in 45, 46, but there are even more similarities in terms of the proceedings and the practice that is followed. And I think there is very interesting work to be done on the way in which that process in 45, 46, in effect, set in stone a number of uh, particular issues. And the fifth point uh, that I would make is the broad theme that I've taken, um, the place of the individual. When I was a law student, a graduate law student, taught about Nuremberg for the first time, no one ever spoke to me of the role played by the individual prosecutors, the individual judges, the individual defendants, the psychologists, the psychologists, because there were more than one, who were hired at Nuremberg by the prosecution to stop the defendants from killing themselves after one of them did, Robert Lay, before the trial uh, began. And the interplay between the psychologists and the prosecutors, the way in which the psychologists used their professional space to report back to the prosecutors on what the defendants were talking about, what they were conversing with, what they were engaging with, what their moods were like, whether they were depressed, whether they were feeling better, what they thought about the trial, and so on and so forth. All of this, I think, informs the sense of a very different reality from the one that I was taught about, taught on uh, in my student days, almost the law as mechanically applied. And that experience has changed the way uh, 
that I teach, the way that I think about law, the way that I think about the Nuremberg legacy. Where do we go from here? Uh, I wrap up very, very briefly. Uh, Judge O'Leary uh, mentioned uh, some of the things that I've been working on. Uh, may well be the uh, Bill Shabbos will, will also talk about this. Uh, I and he stood in the Great Hall of Justice uh, in the Peace Palace in The Hague uh, in December 2019 in the remarkable proceedings uh, between the Gambia uh, and Myanmar. And whatever one thinks of those proceedings in terms of their merits or the direction they've taken, the simple fact is that but for Nuremberg, Bill and I would not have been standing in the Great Hall of Justice in December 2019, arguing our respective submissions to a panel of judges based on the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Now, he may well have a different view on the merits of it, but, but whatever one thinks of the merits uh, of that process or outcome, it surely is warts and all a positive development that unlike the period 39 to 45, when allegations are made, far from perfectly, there are nevertheless today some fora which are available in which these matters can be aired. It's still few and far between. We still don't have a convention on crimes against humanity, something I regret deeply. I very much hope James Kingston, uh, who has a, such an important role to play, can uh, persuade the Irish government to play a leadership role in promoting the convention, which has been drafted by the UN International Law Commission and which now lingers in the General Assembly of the United Nations, because remarkably the countries that gave us the Nuremberg trial, the United States and the United Kingdom have, at least until recently, may change now uh, with President Biden, turned their backs on the idea of international criminal justice uh, as something that is a useful way forward. But let me end on one final positive note. Uh, Judge O'Leary mentioned the work that I've been privileged to be involved in for the last six months, uh, where I was asked to co-chair the very distinguished Senegalese lawyer, a working group of about a dozen people on uh, the creation possibly of a new international crime. One of the things that people are not aware of is that the four existing international crimes, war crimes, crime of aggression, crimes against humanity and genocide, were all in place, warts and all, in 1945. There has been no new international crime for 75 years. There have been variations on the theme and genocide has been interpreted and reinterpreted. It includes things like rape, for example, which it didn't include 75 years ago, but essentially there have been no new international crimes. And against that background, with the current challenges and threats posed to our global environment and to our local environments, uh, a few NGOs have come together with support from foundations to create a working group on the elaboration of a definition for a new crime of ecocide, uh, massive and systematic damage to the environment. I have to say it's been a rather challenging exercise. It's not so easy um, to come up with a definition uh, which meets the objectives uh, of um, dealing with the most heinous acts whilst not criminalizing uh, certain other acts. We've had intensely complex conversations uh, for example, in relation to climate change, which each and every one of us are, on this webinar are uh, complicit in, in some way. Does that make all of us uh, criminals in some way? Uh, how do you draw the line um, between different actors in relation to something like uh, climate change? This is not so easy. But in the elaboration of that work, which is now concluded and which will be announced uh, next week uh, with the hope that a number of states will then take forward the definition and propose an amendment to the statute uh, of, the, of the Hague Court, the International Criminal Court, we have come up with a definition. We had a meeting with a group of friendly countries yesterday, 14 of them, it's an extremely interesting conversation. And there does seem to be an appetite to take things forward, uh, which excites me. But what inspired us the most? What inspired us the most was the work of Lemkin, who invented the concept of genocide, and Lauterpacht, who put the concept of crimes against humanity into the Nuremberg Statute and into international law in the summer of 1945. 
both men had been through the most ghastly experiences. They'd lost pretty much their entire families, uh, but they only discovered it whilst they were serving as prosecutors or support to the prosecution teams in the Nuremberg trial. And the trial opened. They did not know that the man they were prosecuting, Hans Frank, was responsible for the murder of their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, their nephews, and their nieces. They only learned that uh, after July 1946. And what strikes me as remarkable is that in that period, rather than curl up in a corner and weep, these two individuals decided to put their energies into the elaboration of the two new international crimes. And the legacy of those we have the benefit of today. They are far from perfect. We know that. I'm not starry-eyed about international criminal law, but as Tom Bergenthal put it, it's a lot better than nothing, as it was when he was at Auschwitz in 1944. So in that context, I uh, commend to you the idea of thinking openly about the possibility of new international crimes in the situations where we face new challenges and new difficulties of which the protection of the environment is one, but no doubt there will be others to think of. The bottom line is that my own perception is that Nuremberg was hugely positive in terms of its contribution to the state of our world. It has not entirely changed our world. It has not stopped mass murder from taking place. But as Tom Bergenthal would put it, we are a lot better off with the legacy of Nuremberg and with what did happen, warts and all, that if, than if it had not happened at all. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And I look forward to joining the conversation later on. Thank you very, very much, uh, Philippe, for that absolutely uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, I should say that in an exchange earlier on this afternoon with Philippe, I know that many people in Ireland had been hoping that he would come and address his subject and his book, East West Street. And he also, in his very busy schedule, made time some time ago to come to the European Court of Human Rights and talk about the book and his work. As I preside the chamber where Ukraine sits, I'm very often brought down the streets of Lviv. So reading his book on that occasion and rereading parts of it for today really is, is something which is present in our daily work here in the court. And I should say on this last note, we are better off because of the Nuremberg trials, despite the criticism that you can level at the trials, the lopsided justice that he, expl he explained to us, I should say as an international judge or a European judge sitting on the European Court of Human Rights, when people rightly criticize judgments of this court, I do often respond with names of individual cases from their own countries and say, are we better off with those judgments uh, or without them? Uh, but thank you for that uh, wonderful speech and, uh, during the course of the panel discussion and the Q&A, I'm sure that different panelists will be picking up on some of the themes that you've mentioned. Just to explain to the audience how we're going to organize the rest of the afternoon, I'll now briefly introduce the uh, four panelists. Uh, I'll introduce them as one block and then uh, pass the floor to them one by one. The question and answer session will be a joint question and answer session involving all of them. Uh, and of course, if there's a paucity of questions coming from the audience, what I will do is feed the panel some questions and invite them to discuss amongst themselves. Uh, as Jeff mentioned earlier, this isn't just a legal uh, afternoon, it is uh, looking at Nuremberg from a multidisciplinary perspective. So our first panelist is Francine Hirsch, who's a professor of history at the University of Wisconsin. And we're particularly grateful to her that she rose very early this morning on the other side of the Atlantic to join the panel. She specializes in Soviet history, modern European history, and the history of human rights. And her academic uh, work has attracted several awards. Of particular interest for today's discussion is her second book published in 2020, entitled Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, which looks at the critical role of the Soviet Union in the International Military Tribunal. And Philippe, before going on air, actually expressed his regret that he didn't have a copy of the book when he prepared East West Street. Also in the preparatory uh, session, the non-historians amongst us learned of the details of her very difficult archive work in this particular field. Our next pan pan panelist will be Professor Bill Shabas, who needs no introduction to an Irish audience. He's a professor of international law at Middlesex University, and he's also affiliated to Le Leiden University, 
Sciences Po in Paris and University College Galway, where he's the honorary chairman of the Irish Center for Human Rights. He's an author of over 20 books and 300 journal articles, including monographs on genocide, the International Criminal Court, and for Strasbourg observers and indeed Strasbourg judges, the Bible, which is his commentary on the European Convention on Human Rights. I should stress today that Bill has a long-standing relationship with the Royal Irish Academy, uh, and he is a laureate of its gold medal in the social sciences. Our third pan panelist will come at the subject from an entirely uh, different perspective. Her focus will be away from law and history towards medicine and public health. Professor Sandra Crosby is an associate professor of both of these topics at Boston University, where she works in the Center of Health Law, Ethics and Human Rights. And she is an internationally recognized expert in documentation of human rights violations and on performing forensic medical evaluations utilizing the Istanbul protocols in countries around the world. Now, I should explain that the Istanbul protocol is a manual on the effective investigation and documentation of torture. She's one of the very few independent clinicians to have evaluated prisoners at the Guantanamo Bay uh, Detention Center. And our final panelist, James Kingston, will be well known to many members of uh, the Irish audience. He's a legal advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs where he's worked for over 25 years, but he's also taught international law at Trinity University College Dublin and SOAS in London. And he's written on EU human rights and international law, despite his heavy workload in the department. Now I should add in the interests of full disclosure that James and I have known each other since our student days. However, I hope I won't make him blush and I saw Philip Sands referring to the same thing. If I add that a particular word of praise should go to him and his colleagues at the Department of Foreign Affairs. If Ireland now occupies a seat on the UN Security Council and has engaged carefully and extremely professionally with many of the most challenging legal and political questions of the day in recent years for our island, it's in no small part down to unsung heroes like James and his colleagues at the Department of Foreign Affairs and related departments. So that's a brief introduction of the work of our four panelists. And I can assure you having read their CVs, my introduction doesn't do any of them justice. Uh, now I will turn first to Francine Hirsch, to whom I'll give the floor and who'll address Nuremberg from a historical perspective. Francine, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just give my thanks to the, the Royal Irish Academy for having me here today to participate in this. It's, it's really a great honor. Um, so I'm really delighted to, to help you all mark the 75th anniversary of the International Military Tribunal, or IMT. This, of course, was the trial of 22 former Nazi leaders and their organizations, including the SS and the Gestapo, for war crimes, crimes against peace, and crimes against humanity. It was the first of the Nuremberg trials, and it would turn out to be the only four power one. I'm a great admirer of the work of Philippe Sands, and I greatly enjoyed his talk today. I come at Nuremberg from a somewhat different perspective, although I have to say that I share his interest in the importance of individuals and in thinking about the, the history and politics of the trial as well. My book, Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, um, is based on extensive research in five Moscow archives and, and a wide range of other sources, and it sets out to tell a new history of the Nuremberg trials. It examines the Soviet contribution to Nuremberg, as well as the many ways in which Soviet participation threatened to undermine the IMT's legitimacy right from the start. It also uses the Soviet piece to tell a sometimes surprising story of the Nuremberg trials as a whole. Nuremberg wasn't just a struggle between the prosecution and the defense. It was also a contest among all four countries of the prosecution, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union for power, for influence, and for control over the narrative of the Second World War. The relationships among the four prosecution teams in Nuremberg and among the four judges and between the prosecutors and the judges are all highly revealing. We see clashes about the meaning of justice and the compromises that were made on all sides. We see the importance of the nightlife and the parties in Nuremberg with an endless flow of alcohol for keeping things congenial and sometimes for keeping the trials on track. We see how the Nuremberg courtroom became a front of the Cold War, 
and how the politics of the Cold War shape the telling of the Nuremberg story. And I would say an emphasis that we, we tend to still have on the American and the British roles in the trial. So my book makes a number of arguments and I'll briefly take you through four of them before reflecting on their implications for thinking about Nuremberg's legacy. Okay, so argument one, without the Soviet push for an international tribunal and Soviet ideas about international criminal law, the Nuremberg trials likely would not have happened. The IMT is often portrayed as a, as a triumph of purely liberal ideas and Western, largely American and British leadership. This is part of the Nuremberg myth that coalesced as the Cold War developed, but it was actually the Soviet in the darkest days of the Second World War, pushing for a special international tribunal, as they called it, to try the Nazi leaders. The Americans and the British initially were slow to come on board. The Soviet lawyer, Aron Trainin, put forward critical arguments about the criminal responsibility of Nazi leaders for waging aggressive war, war of conquests, wars of conquest, arguments that shaped the international conversation and the IMT's framework. It was actually Trainin who coined the term crimes against peace, which became one of the three counts in the Nuremberg Charter, along with war crimes and crimes against humanity. Argument two, the Soviets had no idea what they had set in motion and were greatly handicapped on the international stage by the constraints of Stalinism. The Soviets took Nazi guilt as a given. They aimed to use the IMT to demonstrate this guilt and to tell a story about Soviet suffering and Soviet heroism. The Soviets expected each and every defendant to hang. It was no coincidence that Stalin had appointed Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Vyshinsky, who had been the chief prosecutor in the Moscow show trials of 1936 to 1938 as the head of one of the Soviet Union's two secret Nuremberg commissions. This commission, which was based in Moscow, was supposed to oversee the Soviet delegation and the Soviet case from afar. Nor was it a coincidence that almost all members of the Soviet legal team at Nuremberg, including Soviet judge Yona Nikachenko and Soviet chief prosecutor Roman Rudenko, had all they had earned their political stripes in the Soviet show trials of the 1930s. The Soviets thought that the victors would control the script at Nuremberg just as the prosecution had done in the Moscow trials and in the Soviet Union's own war crimes trials. They were so confident of this that they insisted on including one of their own atrocities, the Katyn massacre of thousands of Polish prisoners of war, Polish officers, of including this in the indictment as a German war crime. The Soviets believed that the defendants wouldn't be allowed to challenge the evidence. The Soviets were so confident of the victors controlling the script that they initially didn't tell Rudenko, their chief prosecutor, about the secret protocols to the Soviet-German non-aggression pact of 1939, in which Hitler and Stalin had plotted out the conquest and division of Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They didn't think that Rudenko needed to know, even though former German foreign minister, Johann von Ribbentrop, who had signed this pact, was one of the defendants. Stalinism, with its suspicion, secrecy, and centralization, left the Soviet delegation unprepared in other ways as well. And just to give one example, the Soviets did not have enough able translators or interpreters at Nuremberg, partly because of the Soviet, many of the Soviet Union's German speakers had been arrested and shot during the Stalinist terror of the 1930s. Okay. Argument three, in spite of all of this, at Nuremberg, the Soviets presented powerful proof, powerful evidence of what we now know as the Holocaust and what at the time was talked about as Hitler's final solution. This Soviet contribution is often overlooked, in part because earlier Soviet war crimes trials spoke of crimes against peaceful Soviet citizens, even when the victims were Jews in part because of the Soviet Union's anti-Semitic, anti-cosmopolitan campaign that was launched in the years after Nuremberg. The Soviet presentations at Nuremberg on crimes against humanity and the testimony of Soviet eyewitnesses like the Yiddish poet Avraham Sutskever were absolutely fundamental to the trials. They turned rumors and generalities about the Einsatzgruppen and about the death camps, just to give a couple of examples, into living facts. 
They told the story of the annihilation of Europe's Jews while integrating it into a larger narrative about the wartime suffering of the entire Soviet people in the German occupied East. Without Soviet eyewitnesses, Nuremberg would have had far less of an impact. Okay, argument four. The Nuremberg trials became an early front of the Cold War and understanding Nuremberg as such gives us an important perspective on the post-war movement for human rights. So the prosecution presented its case from November 1945 through February 1946. And during that time, tensions among the four powers, they were there, but they were mostly kept under wraps. Then in March of 1946, the Cold War blew into the Nuremberg courtroom. On March 5th, Former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill gave his quote unquote Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, calling for Anglo American resistance to Soviet tyranny. The very next day, the defense case began in the Palace of Justice. When the Soviets got to the courtroom, there were copies of the US Army newspaper Stars and Stripes everywhere with the headline Unite to Stop Russians. The defense attorneys were even holding up copies of their newspaper, of this newspaper for their clients to read. All of this energized the defendants who upped their efforts to drive a wedge between the Soviets and the Western powers. The defense had great success in the weeks and months that followed. Hermann Goering insisted that Germany had launched a preventive war against the Soviet Union in particular and not a war of aggression. Ribbentrop riveted the courtroom with his description of the secret protocols to the Soviet German non-aggression pact. He argued that if Germany was guilty of crimes against peace, then the Soviets certainly were too. One Soviet informant, and there were lots of Soviet journalists and secret police agents who were reporting back to Moscow over the course of the entire trial. And one of these informants writing home after Ribbentrop's testimony expressed alarm that the Soviet Union, and I'll quote him here, the, a country of victors had gone to Nuremberg to prosecute the fascists and had instead become the object of their provocative attacks. The challenges to the Soviet Union in Nuremberg kept coming. Goering's attorney petitioned for witnesses to counter Soviet charges that German forces had carried out the Katyn massacre and the Western judges outvoting the Soviet judge Nikachenko allowed it. The witnesses ultimately cast enough doubt on the Soviet version of events that no mention of Katyn appeared in the judgment. Now, the after hour socializing, and there was lots of after hour socializing throughout the course of the entire trial. And again, these individual relationships that Philippe mentioned, these are extremely important for everyone involved. So this after hour socializing, which included pool parties and tennis matches and lots of drinking, right? Um, this prevented things in Nuremberg from completely falling apart, right? The relationships among the judges and among the prosecutors remained intact. But back in Moscow, Soviet leaders interpreted all decisions that the judges made um, against their interests after that. And there were many three to one votes against Nikachenko as part of an Anglo-American anti-Soviet plot. In the end, Nuremberg was a disappointment for the Soviets, who never expected their own actions to be subject to scrutiny. Now, of course, they, they weren't on trial, but subject to scrutiny nonetheless, and who were expecting guilty verdicts and hangings down the line. 12 of the 22 defendants were sentenced to death by hanging. Three were acquitted, which the Soviets never could understand, um, and others received prison sentences. Notably, the Soviets still wanted more four power trials after this, especially of the industrialists who had financed Hitler. Many of them were in American custody, but the Americans were done cooperating with the Soviets after Nuremberg and went on to hold the subsequent Nuremberg trials on their own. As a result of Nuremberg, the Cold War and the post-war movement for human rights became completely entangled. This in turn shaped and for a long time hampered deliberations in the United Nations and in other institutions about turning the Nuremberg principles as they came to be called and which included crimes against peace and crimes against humanity into permanent international law and creating a permanent international criminal court. 
Well, what does all of this do for our thinking about Nuremberg? What does a fresh look at Nuremberg's history and bringing in the Soviets, what does it do for our evaluation of Nuremberg's legacy? I just wanna say it's a delicate balance to tell the Nuremberg story in all of its complexity. The full Nuremberg story has elements to it that no one really wants to talk about, both in the West and in Russia. But I want to suggest, even insist, that we need the full story. We need it because Nuremberg still matters. The full Nuremberg story offers us important lessons about both the perils and the possibilities of international cooperation. Bringing in the Soviets fully to the story, appreciating their role in it, but also appreciating um, the complications along the way, bringing in evidence from the Soviet archives, it makes it clear that the IMT was not simply the result of Western leadership. It upends the myth of Nuremberg as fully grounded in liberal ideas about justice and the law. Nuremberg involved endless negotiations and difficult compromises by representatives of four governments with very different experiences of the war and very different ideas about justice. All of which I think make its achievements all the more remarkable. Representatives from the United States, Great Britain and France and the Soviet Union managed to find common ground even as early Cold War tensions flared. They created a comprehensive record of the crimes of the Third Reich and pushed forward the work of denazification. They set a precedent that launching a war of aggression, a war of conquest, was a criminally punishable act. And there's more. Nuremberg and dissatisfaction with Nuremberg's limitations, especially when it came to punishing a state's crimes against its own subjects or citizens, sparked and shaped a critical international conversation after Nuremberg about crimes against humanity, genocide, and the protection of human rights. And yes, the Cold War politicization of human rights, this is part of the Nuremberg story, and it helps explain why the promise of the Nuremberg principles has fallen short. The end of the Cold War did eventually see the founding of the International Criminal Court, of course, but as all of us know, a number of powerful nations, including the United States and Russia, have regarded it and continue to regard it with suspicion or outright disdain, right? Politics are still an issue. But that's not the full story either. The Nuremberg Principles had an impact, not just at the institutional level, but also at the grassroots level during the Cold War and later. They inspired, the Nuremberg Principles inspired civil rights organizations in the United States, as well as dissident groups in the Eastern Bloc who used the language of the Nuremberg Principles to put forward their claims. This too is part of Nuremberg's legacy. And at the end of the day, a legacy that I find much more inspiring than any Nuremberg myth. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francine, for your uh, contribution. During the course of the preparation, I expressed some concern as the chair that between the chair and the panelists, there were, uh, I think, the four different legal experts. Uh, and our concern was very much that this afternoon's discussion would not just concentrate on the legal legacies uh, of Nuremberg. That's why I think it's very important that Francine uh, kicked off the panel discussion and what was very interesting was how she picked up on a number of themes which Philippe had already identified, the place of the individual in the making of the trials. Uh, and she mentioned the pool parties, copious quantities of, of alcohol and tennis matches. And what I can say, and please don't misinterpret what I'm saying, is working in a European court with 46 other judges in which deliberations, judicial deliberations are really a form of, of intellectual ex exchange, but also intellectual combat. I can perfectly identify with uh, the emphasis she places on the exchanges between the judges, between the judges and the prosecution and those involved in the trial outside of the courtroom. Although I should add that there are no pool parties, uh, tennis matches and copious quantities of alcohol 
uh, going on in Strasbourg. The other thing that she touched on was the fragility of the legacy uh, and something I'm sure that Bill will, will pick up on. What's very interesting is to think if we had met 15 years ago or if we meet in 15 years, would the historical perspective has changed? I think Francine shows that it probably would have because as time goes by, we are able to criticize the trial, the judgment and the legacy uh, knowing, however, and emphasizing its enormous contribution uh, to law and international dis diplomacy and politics. Without further ado, I pass the floor to our next legal expert. The title of his inter intervention is Legacies, uh, but I think that he'll be picking up on questions relating to the definition of international crimes, the development of international criminal justice, and perhaps touching on one or two judgments of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Bill, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Judge O'Leary. Um, it's a great honor to be able to follow such great, such wonderful speakers. Um, you mentioned, uh, Judge O'Leary, how the perspective on Nuremberg uh, is changing. And part of that is due to the fantastic work of researchers like Francine, who have given us a, a, a totally different, new and original and, and helpful perspective on a trial, most of the materials that have been written have been largely dominated by the American narrative, and we need to hear more about the other participants in the Nuremberg trial. And of course, uh, Philippe Sands, who's uh, written wonderful books, particularly East West Street. Um, he mentioned some of the places we've met, but I think that maybe our greatest uh, common uh, heritage is the fact that we both have ancestors from within a few kilometers of the town of or city of Lviv, uh, where also, of course, Hirsch Lauterpack and Raphael Lemkin went to university. This narrative of, of the Nuremberg trial, or the legacy as we're calling it, really began, the debates about the legacy of Nuremberg began the day the judgment was issued on the first, the 30th of September and the 1st of October in 1946. One of, the, one of the members of the American prosecution team who passed away now about a decade ago was someone I knew fairly well, Henry King. And Henry told of meeting Raphael Lemkin, the man who uh, invented the term genocide, meeting him in the lobby of the Grand Hotel in the city of Nuremberg. The Grand Hotel, it's still there. Um, um, you can stay there, although it's a much more expensive hotel today, I think. And uh, they were, that's where the American team was quartered and other, other people involved in the trial. And Lemkin was there and he was very unhappy about the judgment, maybe the first person to complain about the judgment, other perhaps otherwise than the, the people who were convicted, of course. What Lemkin didn't like about it, and this is how Henry explained it, he said the, the Nazis were found guilty of wartime genocide, but not of peacetime genocide. And of course, the term genocide wasn't even used in the judgment, but what Lemkin was referring to was the atrocities, which were labeled crimes against humanity at Nuremberg, and the fact that the judges, following decisions by those who had created the legal framework of the trial, decided not to uh, impose any convictions for acts perpetrated before the outbreak of the war in 1939. They discussed them, they discussed the Kristallnacht, the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, but there were no convictions for it. Um, this then became an issue in the United Nations General Assembly. Lemkin rushed back to New York City where he was living at the time and started lobbying at the General Assembly, which was holding the second phase of its first session um, in starting in October, November and into December of 1946. There were two resolutions that were in a way the legacy of Nuremberg that were adopted, 95 and 96. They were both adopted on the same day within minutes of each other in December, on the 11th of December, 1946. The first is the Nuremberg Principles Resolution. And that was proposed by the United States. Um, it said that it was an idea that came straight from President Truman. And the second was the Genocide Resolution. And that was came from Raphael Lemkin, although it was presented in the General Assembly by three delegations, all three of them from the Global South, uh, India, Cuba, and Panama. Uh, 
When the uh, American delegates rose to present the resolution on the Nuremberg legacy, they said that this was to, uh, to, to recognize and to entrench the principles established in the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal and in the judgment. When the Cuban delegate rose to propose the genocide resolution, he said this was to correct a shortcoming of the Nuremberg judgment. So while we have a tendency to see these two resolutions as being part of a, a kind of a, as twins, in fact, they're, they're, there's an antagonism before them. There's a tension between them because the second one, the one on genocide, expresses a dissatisfaction with the first. And what that dissatis dissatisfaction was, was with, was with the refusal of the judges to convict for crimes that happened during the 1930s before the outbreak of the war. Why was that? How do we understand why that happened? Well, we can go right back to the London Conference, which is where the legal framework of the trial was, was agreed to. That was in 1945, mainly in July and early August. And there, let me read you a quote from the American negotiator, who was Robert Jackson, who went on to be the prosecutor uh, for the United States in the trial. And Jackson said, when they were discussing the definition of crimes against humanity, he said, ordinarily, we do not consider that the acts of a government towards its own citizens warrant our interference. I'm quoting from the record. We have some regrettable circumstances at times in our own country in which minorities are unfairly treated. So Jackson's not being entirely precise, but we all know what he's talking about, which was the pattern of Jim Crow legislation of lynchings and of general oppression and racial discrimination towards the African American minority. And it was from that was the reason why peacetime genocide was left out at Nuremberg. It's something that's been corrected now in international criminal law. We now recognize since the 1990s, beyond any doubt, that international crimes, like a crime against humanity, can be committed in peacetime, as well as the crime of genocide. The unease about the Nuremberg judgment continued and manifested itself not much longer, much, not much later in the debates about the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which took place in the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, in 1948. And there in the debates, we find concern being expressed when they're drafting a provision in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights prohibiting retroactive criminal prosecution. And that was something that was found in the constitutions of many countries. There was concern by several of the delegates that if this were expressed as a, a total prohibition on retroactive criminal prosecution, it might constitute or be interpreted as a criticism of Nuremberg. And so they agreed to put a second sentence into or a second idea into the clause, Article 11, Paragraph 2 of the Universal Declaration, that says no one is to be found guilty of a, of a criminal offense on account of an act or omission, which was not an offense under national or international law. And the idea being that that would respond to the criticism that Nuremberg was retroactive. It would be argued that this was uh, customary law at the time. But a year later, after the Universal Declaration was adopted, and when the debates were underway about the European Convention on Human Rights, the belief was that that wasn't enough. And so yet another paragraph was added. And in the, in the European Convention on Human Rights, we can see this. We have Article 7, Paragraph 1, which is a, an absolute replica of Article 11, Paragraph 2 of the Universal Declaration. But a second clause was added to make it clear that Nuremberg was protected. And to this day, it, at the European Court of Human Rights, it's called the Nuremberg Clause. Something I came across recently in some research into a related area of law, refugee law, uh, also shed some light on the Nuremberg legacy. Uh, the general, the, the 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 convention on the, on the status of refugees is one of the first treaties to be adopted within the United Nations system. The treaties finally adopted in 1951. In 1950, 
the United Nations General Assembly agreed upon a, uh, a, a text uh, that was then submitted to a diplomatic conference. The issue that interests us today and that they were concerned about was that war criminals would claim refugee status and would then be able to invoke this new convention. And so they put a clause in there saying that anyone who was seriously suspected of being a war criminal would be excluded from refugee status from the protection of the convention. And the clause that the General Assembly uh, adopted as a draft in 1950 referred to the Nuremberg, the, the Charter of the International Military Tribunal, the Charter of the Nuremberg Trials. When the diplomatic conference assembled, there was a debate about this clause and it was raised by Germany. Now, Germany had, had not been involved in multilateral diplomacy since 1933 when Hitler had withdrawn from the League of Nations. In 1951, Germany is back. Their delegation comes back and they say, we can't live with that clause. We don't want that reference to Nuremberg in there because we don't like it. We don't agree with it. And we don't disagree with saying international crimes, but don't link it to Nuremberg. There was one delegation in the room that was very unhappy. That was the delegation of Israel. Some of the Jewish NGOs that were represented also complained about it. And so they struck off a little committee to discuss it. Um, the committee was made up of Britain, France, Israel, and Germany. And the British and the French, who of course had ownership of the Nuremberg trial, they had been two of the four countries that hosted the trial. The British and the French basically agreed with the Germans and Israel's objections were dismissed. So this shows a couple of things. It shows us the, the, the loss of enthusiasm for Nuremberg amongst the British and the French at the time, the unhappiness in Germany with Nuremberg at the time. These are, these are things that of course have changed very dramatically. That was an, an initial take on the legacy. I mentioned this recently to German colleagues of mine and their explanation, the only explanation they can give for Germany's feelings in 1951, as they say, the foreign ministry was still full of Nazi sympathizers, former diplomats who had been there under Hitler. Well, let me move forward now. Not much happens in international criminal justice for, for many years. And uh, we it, it comes back in the 1990s when there are references to it. The first reference to Nuremberg uh, at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is in a very early decision in 1995. And it's actually not very positive. It talks about the flaws of the Nuremberg judgment. All of that's changed, of course, today. And as the other speakers have pointed out, we revere Nuremberg and the judgment and for all of its, uh, all of the issues about it, recognize what a, what a profound achievement it is. Let me just, uh, I, I realize my, the clock is ticking and I only have a, a few more minutes. A few of the issues as they arise in recent years with regard to Nuremberg, there is underway in Central and Eastern Europe in particular, still quite a debate about the Second World War, uh, about the role of the Soviet Union in the Second World War, about the, the role of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of different participants, about the, the Germany's participation and a role about the national elements in countries like Poland and Lithuania and so on. And that's manifested itself uh, amongst, in other places, not other places, the, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, there have been any number of uh, decisions now dealing with issues of Holocaust denial in which reference will often be made, although not always, to the Nuremberg judgment. I think the most recent, by the way, Judge O'Leary is the one you were involved in, Pastors versus Germany, which was issued only a year and a half or two, uh, not quite a year and a half ago. But there have been others that challenged laws in, in, in Lithuania, in Poland, in Russia. There's one underway uh, dealing with a, a prosecution in Russia of somebody for adopting a criticism of the Nuremberg judgment. And the Russian law says that that amounts to denial of the truth of the Second World War. And of course, we have a similar law in France, which has been tested at the European Court of Human Rights uh, 
and also by the United Nations Human Rights uh, Committee. Francine referred to one of these, the, these sores, these lingering sores of the Nuremberg Judgment, which is the treatment of the Katyn massacre, uh, the massacre by the Soviets of the Polish officers that was then uh, at, raised at Nuremberg and where there were two days of evidence in an attempt to actually convict the Germans for a crime that the Soviet leaders, perhaps not the prosecutor, perhaps not the judge, but the Soviet leaders at the highest level were certainly aware that it was actually not the work of the Germans, but the work of the Soviets. I was uh, involved in that case about Katyn when it came to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I was counsel to Poland, and one of the arguments that Poland tried to put forward uh, in the hearing before the Grand Chamber of the European Court was that the, um, uh, the, 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 the Katyn had been left unresolved by the Nuremberg Tribunal, and that that was the first European Court of Human Rights, in a way, the Nuremberg Tribunal, and that its successor, that the European Court of Human Rights is in a way the successor of the International Military Tribunal in dealing with human rights in Europe, and it was, it was its job to rectify the situation. We managed to convict, convince four or five of the judges, but of course, in a 17-judge panel, um, that's not enough. And so very unfortunately, I think the European Court um, step back from that. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Bill. And I have no doubt that you'll be coming back into the panel discussion because there are there's a common thread running through uh, your presentation, and that is Francine's, that one's perspective on legacies changes with time. Uh, and that the farther away you get from a judgment or a trial, perhaps the more critically you can look at it, but also you can appreciate even more its enormous contribution uh, to international law, not just international criminal justice, uh, but also the development of international human rights law, which is something I'm sure we will discuss in the question and answer session. Just to explain to the audience the case that uh, Bill referred to, Pastors Against Germany, is an example of a Holocaust denial case that comes to this court, not just from Germany, but also uh, from other countries. There are French cases and cases from other uh, respondent states, often under Article 10 of the convention, where uh, the individual has been convicted at domestic level. And the question is whether this is an interference with their freedom of expression rights. Uh, and these are indeed very difficult cases. But we've had a number of other cases in which either Nuremberg, as Bill explains, is either explicitly referenced or is the background to the facts uh, and the discussion before our court many decades later. I'm thinking of cases involving Germany, Strelitz, in, about the conviction of senior GDR officials for participating in the killing of East Germans. I'm thinking of Kononov against Latvia, a case which uh, Bill I know has written quite a lot about, which is a conviction under legislation introduced in 1993 for war crimes committed in the Second World War. And as regards the case that Bill just mentioned, uh, and he explained his disappointment, Janowitz and others against Russia, uh, this was a case in which the court felt it didn't have jurisdiction to investigate the right to life questions under Article 2. But very importantly, the court did find unanimously, under a different provision of the convention, that there had been a failure to provide the necessary information, which in some of these legacy cases is absolutely vital. And for an Irish audience, it may be interesting to know that a case like Janowitz and others, although it may disappoint counsel, pops up in judgments of the Northern Irish courts uh, dealing with some legacy issues uh, such as the hooded men. Uh, so uh, Bill, in one of his articles on Nuremberg, referred to, and I smiled when I read this, uh, the traditional prudence of the Strasbourg court, and I can fully identify the frustration which counsel must feel. But in these cases, dealing with uh, such deep, divisive and legacy issues, my experience is that over time, even the disappointing judgments uh, show their value. And that's also what we're discussing today about the Nuremberg trials uh, and judgment. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, this brings me to our third panelists and we leave behind the legal theme uh, and move to something quite different. Our third panelist uh, tilts the focus away from law and history and towards medicine and public health. Professor Sandra Crosby is an associate professor of 
both at Boston University, where she works, as I said, in the Center of Health Law. And she'll be looking at questions relating to uh, research ethics and Nuremberg. Professor Crosby, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a privilege to be here amongst um, such distinguished scholars. And um, again, my, uh, my presentation this afternoon is gonna take a little bit of a different path, as you can tell. And I look forward to discussion um, at the end of the, of the session. So I'm gonna start um, from a US perspective. Um, in August, 2014, 12 years after the prison at Guantanamo Bay received its first prisoners in the war on terror, then US President Obama confessed, quote, we tortured some folks, unquote. Pretty astounding. Um, 75 years now after the Nuremberg doctor's trial, which began in December, 1946, doctors working with lawyers played a critical role in the US government sponsored torture program in the CIA black sites and US military detention centers, um, which included Abu Ghraib, Bagram, and in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So what are some of the similarities between the Nazi doctors and health professionals in the war on terror? You know, the question we ask is, how did it happen that these health professionals, highly educated, um, including doctors, nurses, psychologists, and physicians assistants, acted as agents of the state to utilize their medical and healing skills um, to cause harm and to sanitize barbarous acts, similar to, though not on the scale of, of how Nazi doctors were utilized by the Third Reich. And I completely acknowledge this is not the Holocaust. The acts of physicians at black sites and detention centers are not remotely comparable to the atrocities committed by the Nazi doctors, but this is far from an exculpatory observations. Um, behaviors less severe than the Nazi atrocities can still meet the definition of torture and grossly violate ethical and professional um, standards of practice. On the other hand, there's a clear parallel between the issues that arose in the doctor's trial and the actions of health professionals at CIA black sites and military detention centers. The commonality is that in both cases, health professionals discarded their ethical obligations to prevent harm to people and instead became agents of the state. In 2002, the then US president signed a memorandum on the humane treatment of Al-Qaeda and Taliban detainees, which specifically determined that the Geneva Conventions of 1949 would not be applied with the following justification. And this is important. The war against terrorism ushers in a new paradigm, one in which groups with broad international reach commit horrific acts against innocent civilians sometimes with the direct support of the states. This new paradigm requires new thinking in the law of war, unquote. So this abandonment of the rules, a justification, a justification used by Hitler in World War II led to the creation of the Rendition, Detention and Interrogation Program, RDI, um, commonly known as the US torture program that was designed and facilitated by psychologists, physicians, and other healthcare personnel. It is clear that doctors and lawyers were front and center in colluding to craft the state-sponsored torture regime. So physicians seemingly participated in torture and cruel and human and degrading treatment after they were assured by Justice Department lawyers that they had immunity from future prosecution and would not be legally responsible for violating US and international law as long as they only utilized torture techniques that had been approved in the legal memos. Lawyers agreed to provide this immunity only if the physicians assured them that the techniques they approved would not cause permanent harm, organ damage or death and that they, the physicians, would be present to prevent permanent harm to prisoners. Now, this is, is uh, my area of scholarship. Um, 
the long-term damaging physical and psychological effects of torture are widely reported um, in the medical literature. And the CIA health professionals um, stated opinion that the methods used in this program would cause no lasting damage was either willful ignorance or a lie. Justice Department lawyers in the US argued that the president as commander in chief had the authority to order torture of prisoners and that contrary to the Nuremberg principles, obeying such an order would be a valid defense to a war crime or crime against humanity charge. The U United States had essentially redefined torture to suit its security needs, i.e. drowning, throwing people against walls, suspending them by chains to the ceiling naked for days, force feeding, confinement in boxes, and extreme sleep deprivation for up to 180 hours, all became lawful methods of interrogation. General Counsel of the Navy, Alberto Mora, who is just an outstanding um, intellectual, led an effort within the de Defense Department um, to oppose legal theories put forth in the torture memos to try to end these coercive interrogation tactics, which he argued were unlawful, unsuccessfully. He opined publicly that the administration lawyers did not seem to know or care much about the laws of war, including the Geneva Conventions or Nuremberg Principles. And this was important. In December, 2014, a redacted 600 page summary of the US Senate Intelligent Committee's report on torture. The full 6,000 page report is still classified by the way, um, was released to the public. Um, this was the most detailed summary um, to date of what actually happened in the torture program and documents um, and even further disturbing detail the use of the CIA, the use by the CIA of physicians, lawyers, um, and psychologists in its post 9 11 torture program. And in this report, two contract psychologists, um, James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen, neither with previous interrogation experience, were hired by the CIA and engineered, designed, directed as well as performed interrogations. Um, furthermore, they evaluated the effectiveness of the interrogations they designed and were paid 81 million US dollars. Their interrogation theory that was bought by the United States um, was based on learned helplessness a theory based on dog research to brutally break down the individual to a point um, where he is no, no longer able to resist and um, essentially will confess to whatever the interrogator wants to hear. From the torture report, it became clear that physicians played four basic functions in this program. Um, one, they cleared terrorist suspects as quote, medically fit, unquote, for torture. Um, they monitor torture to prevent death and treat injuries. They developed new torture methods and they actually tortured the prisoners. In addition, it has become known that medical professionals exploited detainees vulnerabilities by sharing medical information with interrogators falsifying both medical records and death certificates to hide crimes and withholding medical care for injured prisoners. Both the Nazi doctors and the CIA contract psychologist claimed their actions were legitimate because they were lawful under the regime they worked for at the time and were necessary to protect the state from its enemies. Mitchell and Jessen offered a defense similar to that used in the doctor's trial, that their actions were authorized and that they were following orders. In a deposition, um, a quote from um, Dr. Bruce Jessen, 
We were soldiers doing what we were instructed to do. We knew it was lawful. We knew it was legal. We knew it had been vetted and approved. Our actions were necessary, effective, legal, and helped to save lives. The fact that an act may be wrong or morally reprehensible played no role in deciding whether to commit the act. And this echoes some of the defense posited at the doctor's trial, namely that the German physicians involved in human experimentation were only following German law at the time. In an attempt to further rationalize his acts, Mitchell attempted to position himself as a protector of the victims he was torturing, i.e. if they, the doctors left, the torture would be even worse. Similar to the Nazi doctor's defense that if physicians did not carry out the medical experiments, less skilled non-medical technicians would cause even more harm. Although the Nazi doctors acted lawfully under German law, this did not save them from being found guilty at Nuremberg. Following orders and relying on laws adopted by one's own country that permitted atrocities to be committed was no defense under the Nuremberg principles. As the Chief Prosecutor General Telford Taylor successfully argued in his opening statement, to kill, to maim, to torture is criminal under all modern systems of law. And this is again where a lot of my academic work um, has been. You know, torture is a particularly horrible crime and any role of physicians and lawyers in conducting or enabling torture has been really difficult to comprehend. Um, in 2004, Robert J. Lifton, um, an acclaimed scholar um, for his pioneering work on Nazi doctors wrote that it is possible to get normal physicians to become torturers by putting them in atrocity producing situations. And I think this really applies to the, to the situation in the war on terror. He defined an atrocity producing situation as an environment so militarily and psychologically structured that an average person entering it could be capable of committing atrocities. He believes that individuals can undergo a type of dissociation he calls doubling, the formation of a second self, which allows the individual psyche to adapt to an atrocity producing environment by means of creating a sub self that behaves as if autonomous and thereby, thereby joins in activities that would otherwise seem repugnant. Also, Torture techniques in Nazi Germany and in the US were translated into medical euphemisms, thus sanitizing and legitimizing harmful acts, i.e. drowning is waterboarding, hypothermia is temperature manipulation, and sodomy is rectal hydration. This echoes justification for Nazi crimes under the guise of scientific research such as high altitude experiments. Medical, medicalization allows physicians to rationalize behavior by bringing it into the scope of their practice. So thinking about atrocity producing environments, um, CIA black sites with their isolation, their distorted ideologies are just ripe to create such an environment. Although former President Barack Obama officially ended the torture program, he rejected any form of accountability process, announcing that, quote, we need to look forward as opposed to looking backwards, end quote, on torture. All avenues of accountability for Bush era torture were curtailed. Civil lawsuits from former detainees were blocked invoking the state secrets doctrine, even a proposal for a South African style truth and reconcil reconciliation commission was rejected. 
all avenues for any form of accountability for torture, criminal, civil, even professional, were blocked by Obama era officials. How did the US become a human rights outlaw? It would have been impossible for the administration of George W. Bush to create the torture program without the cooperation of lawyers and doctors. These professionals who counseled or cooperated in using torture, ignoring the Geneva Conventions and disregarding the Nuremberg principles can be reasonably be labeled as human rights outlaws. Parallels to the motivation of healthcare professionals to commit crimes are evident as are the historical conditions, such as dehumanization of a whole group of people. Analysis and mitigation of conditions that create atrocity producing environments is essential for, for prevention going forward. Since World War II, the US has been one of the world leaders in international human rights movement. However, our roots prove particularly shallow in the aftermath of 9-11. At 75 years after Nuremberg, basic provisions of international human rights law, including the absolute prohibition on torture, are well worth emphasizing, and especially within our professions of medicine and law. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Professor Crosby, for giving us an entirely different perspective of one of the legacies. One of the things that we've been rejoicing is that Nuremberg gave rise to individual criminal responsibility as part of international law. But we see, and this will be a question which has been asked by one of the members of the audience, that it tends to be justice which is reactive rather than preventive. Um, and in, in Strasbourg, I can confirm that sadly far too often, we have what we call Article 3 cases, cases involving torture and inhumane and degrading treatment, involving a variety of states uh, from East and West European states. I'm thinking of cases relating to the Maidan protests in Ukraine in 2013 and 2015, or cases involving rendition, uh, rendition of persons to undisclosed locations where some of the practices that you've been describing uh, were carried out. And these cases involve countries like Poland uh, and Italy. So sadly, the legacies of Nuremberg, which was to some extent a promise and a hope that these things would not be repeated. Indeed, they have been repeated over time. And you touch in your presentation on, on a report by Robert J. Lifton, where you discuss the issue of dissociation and a doubling process. And I have a question for Philippe Sands later in relation to East West Street and his examination of Hans Frank, not least in the final hours of his life in that, in that regard. I turn now to our last and fourth panelist, James Kingston from the Department of Foreign Affairs, and he will uh, talk about contemporary lessons from Nuremberg and particularly international affairs. James, you have the floor. Uh, and thank you, Shira, for uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, colleagues and friends. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank the RIA for the invitation to take part in this afternoon's discussion with such an interesting group of people. And I'm grateful for the support from Jeff, Vanessa, Sharon, Pauline and others involved in organising the event. Um, I'm very glad to be in Schieffer's able hands. Judge O'Leary is not only a highly efficient chair, as you've seen, but also a very distinguished member of the European Court of Human Rights. And I'm not just saying that because she's Irish, or because she's a long-standing friend, or because she said nice things about me earlier. Um, but it really is a particular pleasure to discuss Philippe's fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm a former student. We were colleagues on the legal team for the Sellafield Mox litigation between Ireland and the UK, and we have ongoing collaboration uh, uh, in our careers. And it's also good to be in the virtual room with Bill, Bill Shabbos, who did so much as director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights, to foster Ireland as a hub for international criminal law. And he even paid us the compliment of becoming an Irish citizen. And it's been really interesting as well to collaborate for the first time with Francine uh, Hirsch and, and Sandra Crosby. Um, so in my remarks today, I'm going to look first at accountability as a goal of Irish foreign policy, then turn to discuss the Nuremberg Tribunal and its context and history, before finally looking at contemporary international criminal law and the lessons we've learned from the Nuremberg trials. Uh, 
I should preface my remarks by saying that today, what I say should be looked at in the context of Ireland's commitment to accountability. Accountability is one of the three key priorities for our Security Council tenure from 2021 to 2022. But accountability is always a key foreign policy objective that we pursue in a variety of contexts. And that will include our forthcoming role as chair of the Council of Europe from May to November next year. An Irish support for the International Criminal Court as the heir of the Nuremberg Tribunal, court of last resort for the trial of crimes of aggression, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, reflects this commitment to accountability, as does indeed our support for the proposed Convention on Crimes Against Humanity, which Philippe mentioned earlier. Having said that, my remarks should be looked at as those of a, a jobbing practitioner of international law with some experience of international criminal justice, uh, speaking in an academic forum rather than as an official statement of Irish foreign policy as such. So if we turn now to Nuremberg and its context, I'm conscious of and welcome the fact that this is a multidisciplinary seminar as suggested by Jeff and as we've been reminded on a number of occasions by Shirfra, um, I'm going to look at the tribunal in its historical context, its prehistory also, before going on to outline some of the key lessons for contemporary foreign policy. Now, in terms of Irish connections with Nuremberg, there are some interesting snippets from 1946 in volume eight of the documents in Irish foreign policy. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the documents, uh, they're a collaboration between the RIA and the Department of Foreign Affairs, whereby foreign policy documents dating back from 1919 are published in elegant hard copy, uh, some behind me, which you can see uh, on my bookshelf, and also made available free online. Um, and 1919, of course, saw the establishment of the Department of Foreign Affairs by the revolutionary parliament, Dáil Éireann. And I think it's always good uh, when you're getting up in the morning, going to work, putting on your suit and tie to remember your revolutionary roots. And per perhaps particularly so when you're talking in the Royal Irish Academy. In any event, the, the main Nuremberg references in the documents comprise a short memorandum on the establishment of the tribunal by my predecessor, Michael Wrynn and a brief mention in a cable by the then High Commissioner to Canada, uh, John Hearn. Now, Hearn was previously the first legal advisor to the department, and he reports on a conversation with Sir Hartley Shawcross, uh, who's already been mentioned this afternoon, uh, who was such a brilliant prosecutor at the trials. And they spoke both about the tribunal and the prospects for codification of international criminal law. And interestingly, uh, the report, Hearn's report, also talks about Ireland's efforts to join the United Nations, which it ultimately did in 1955, neutral states not being allowed to be original members of the organization. In any event, the trials were attended by an Irish academic historian, Desmond Williams, then of the UK Foreign Office, um, and Professor Frances Moran, the first and to date only female Regis Professor of Laws at Trinity College Dublin. Professor Moran, a remarkable woman, the first woman in these islands to take silk. The trials were also attended by a young Irish lawyer from County Limerick, Helenus Milmo, who subsequently became a judge of the High Court uh, of England and Wales. He was part of the prosecution team of the trials. And incidentally, he was also grandfather of the former UK MP, Chuka Amuna. Now, it's not always remembered in Europe and North America that the Nuremberg tribunals had a, a twin in the East, uh, the tribunal uh, the Tokyo Tribunal that Philippe mentioned. And the context for their establishment, of course, was the heinous atrocities committed in Europe and Asia uh, in the years preceding and during World War II, most notably the genocide in Europe of Jews, Roma and Sinti people, gender non-conforming persons, particularly gay men and trans women, as well as other so-called inferior groups. In some ways, the Holocaust was unique in its scale and efficiency. But history is unfortunately burdened by many massive human rights violations amounting to what many might now classify as genocide, committed both before and after the Holocaust. These include the mass killing of the Herero and Nama people, recently acknowledged as genocide by the German government. And this is often cited as the first instance of genocide in modern times. Here in Ireland, there are debates, controversial debates on whether the penal laws of the 18th and early 19th century and the practices surrounding them, which were a factor in the genesis of the great hunger on Goethe Moore, uh, 
sometimes called in Ireland the famine, uh, and, the, and the, the resulting mass deaths and immigration arising out of the government's response or non-response to those events, uh, there's a question as to whether or not they can be classified as genocide. Now, I wouldn't uh, um, uh, comment on this uh, controversy other than to acknowledge its existence. Now, contemporary Ireland has a long memory and memory, like history, gives us an imperfect account of events. But uh, just as a, a brief segue, I remember a, a quite an intense discussion with Bill at a talk he gave to the International Law Association Irish branch on the temporal scope of the European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction, dating back to the very catch and massacre, which we've heard discussed or mentioned a couple of times already this afternoon. And I think it's fair to say that many of us born in Ireland had a fairly broad definition of what counts as contemporary. Um, but in any event, Irish foreign policy is informed by our history and memories. It's reflected in our approach uh, across a range of issues. And one small but not unimportant example of this is our support for amending Article 8 of the Rome Statute to extend the ICC's jurisdiction to criminalise the starvation uh, of civilians as a method of warfare when committed in the context of civil war, as well as in international armed conflicts. And I remember well a discussion with Bill in Kampala about that about 10 years ago. Indeed, Ireland's current role in the Security Council, uh, one of our roles together with Niger is uh, to be a focal point on conflict and hunger. And this also reflects our approach to, to foreign policy and the importance of protecting human rights of the most vulnerable even during time of conflict. In any event, notwithstanding its unique features, the circumstances that led to the Holocaust are not unique. Uh, and as a non-historian, I often find that fictional depictions of real events may draw out essential truths that history written for an expert readership may not bring to life. And again, this comes back to the personal story. And I'd suggest if you haven't had a chance to do so, to watch Conspiracy, which is a 2001 film about the Wanzi conference that initiated the final uh, solution. And for me, watching this film was so chilling because the depiction of the conference is like a video you'd be given as a case study in a public management leadership course, leaving aside the substance. And that might sound preposterous, but, and I'm not saying this facetiously, many people do leave aside the substance and focus on process. They're not consciously malevolent perhaps, but guilty of great wrongdoing. And the film tells the story or a story about this type of bureaucratic detachment that Hannah Arendt so eloquently called the banality of evil. And one detail in the film stands out to me, which is a discussion of sterilizing people of mixed Jewish and Gentile ancestry rather than killing them. And those in favor of sterilization argue that this is in accordance with the rule of law as set out in the Nuremberg laws of 1935, whereas those in favor of mass murder were disdainful of this nitpicking legalistic approach. But looking now at the Nuremberg Tribunal from a more legal perspective, as we've heard one of the main criticisms of the trials is that they constituted victor's justice. They only tried people from the losing side. There's also, as we've heard, criticism to the effect that certain of the crimes within the tribunal's jurisdiction, crime against peace uh, and crimes against humanity constituted ex post facto justice. And it is perhaps true, as Philippe has said, I think that these norms were only emerging in the 20th century and not yet universally acknowledged as law in the 30s and 40s. On the other hand, the law of international armed conflict and accountability for serious breaches of its rules have a long history. And in the Brehan law, the pre-common law system that applied in parts of Ireland from the pre-Christian era up until the turn of the 17th century included laws on the conduct of war set out in the law of innocence, so-called dating back to the year 697 of common era. Now we need many hours to discuss the detail of the establishment of the tribunal and the conduct of the trials but it does appear reasonable to say that they were hugely significant in advancing justice and human rights, notwithstanding the valid criticisms of them. So if we look finally to look at the turn to look at the lessons of Nuremberg for today, I think as again, as has already been said, it's clear that much of modern international law, especially human rights law and international criminal law remains rooted in the horror of World War II. Nuremberg didn't, of course, immediately lead to a permanent tribunal, but 40 or 50 years isn't long in history or in international law, indeed. And for the past 20 years or more, we've had the ICC, which is a permanent court, 
which covers all sides in any situation over which it has jurisdiction. Although imperfect, the court is independent, impartial institution working to end impunity for atrocity crimes in circumstances where states are unable or unwilling to investigate and prosecute them. Uh, and the court operates according, in accordance with a set of predetermined rules. Uh, so the principal requirements of justice and accountability, uh, the legacy of Nuremberg, uh, you know, are, are embodied in the court, uh, however imperfect it is. Um, and all states were entitled to participate in the negotiations leading up to the Rome Statute. And if there's time in question and answers, we might look at the issue that Philippe mentioned, the criticism that the court has somehow got a, you know, an anti-African bias. But in any event, Ireland has, and since its very inception, been a strong supporter of the court. Now, naturally, we know the court has its critics, and some of the loudest criticisms reflect the fact that the court is doing its job. Uh, perpetrators of mass atrocities tend to dislike being held to account. But there are, of course, valid concerns, and one such concern centers on the role of the Security Council within the Rome Statute system. Now, as many of you know, of the permanent five veto-wielding members of the council, only two, UK and France, are party to the statute, yet the council has the power to defer or delay the investigation of situations by the court. This power has been used at the instigation of the US to defer an examination of the activities of non-state parties involved in UN peacekeeping missions. The council also has the power to refer situations to the ICC, and has done so with respect to Darfur and Libya, albeit with exemptions for non-state parties. P5 members have used the veto, Russia and China, with respect to Syria, and there's also been threats to use the veto in uh, other situations. For example, any attempt to refer the situation in Palestine would have been vetoed by the US, although the U Palestine is now a state party and has itself referred the, the case to the matter to, to the court. So the veto has hampered the efforts to ensure that the council fulfills its referral role, which would enable it to act as a truly global institution. And it's also limited the council's own role as guarantor of international peace and security. Now, there's, of course, there are good reasons rooted in World War II for the veto. Uh, it ensured, amongst other things, that the council wouldn't harm relations between allies um, uh, by ruling out the possibility that a decision could be taken without the assent of them all. Uh, and it was understood that such a decision could threaten international peace and security, which of course the UN was set up to prevent. But the power balance has shifted uh, and so has international society and international law. Accountability is one of Ireland's three priorities on the Security Council. And in line with this, we support reform of the veto power, both in law and practice. Ultimately, we'd like to see the abolition of the, of the veto, but meantime, uh, we have supported more modest initiatives, including a 2001 French-Mexican initiative seeking to, to, to limit the use of the veto power. And we also support the 2015 ACT Code of Conduct, uh, reflecting the responsibility to protect doctrine. And that calls on, on P5 not to use their veto power to strike down any relevant resolution intended to prevent or halt mass atrocities. Relatedly, I'd say that there's interesting legal research, including an initiative by Professor Jennifer Trahan, of New York University, whose work may be familiar to some, on the hierarchical relationship between the Charter and use Kogan's norms. And this research suggests that it might be illegal to use the veto in such circumstances. Uh, now, that's a bold claim, but it's perhaps an issue worth exploring. If I have a moment now in conclusion, I'd like to, to finish by quoting in English translation the words of a lawyer, former foreign affairs diplomat and poet, Maura McEntee. In a poem about the Easter, Easter Rising of 1916, written on its 70th anniversary. The poem is called Fodon Imrish, Ardificon Fwisht, Nadeg Okto or in English, Trouble Spot, General Post Office 1986. And the poem is addressed to her father, the former freedom fighter, and subsequently Minister for Foreign Affairs, Sean McEntee. And I think in many ways it reflects elegantly the challenge faced by those of us lucky enough to live and work in what is currently a relatively peaceful part of the world. And in McEntee's words, we are inheritors of the event who never knew the smell of gunpowder or of terror, who never fired a shot in anger and worse yet, never stood up to one. So despite this, I think 
I hope you'll agree that what we must do in our work in support of international criminal justice is to seek to avoid war and mass human rights violations. And where they do occur, we must ensure that they are investigated, prosecuted, and punished in accordance with the highest standards of international law. And most importantly, we must ensure that victims and survivors of these atrocities are recompensed and acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for your uh, contribution. At this stage, uh, I would like to thank the panelists who have made the life of the chair very easy uh, because they really have stuck to our original plan. It, this leaves us with about 30, 35 minutes for a question and answer session. Uh, and I can confirm that we have some uh, written questions which have been sent by members of the uh, audience. The first question regards uh, where one can draw the line between those held responsible at the Nuremberg trials and those who were not. Uh, the questioner puts it in another way. Why were the privates in the SS not executed? He regards this as a difficult moral question and points out that many of those executed were themselves the products or the result of the Nazi system. Uh, and I'm going to field that question for, first to Philippe because during the course of his presentation, he referred to the spider's web and the fact that uh, the bigger flies he, he suggested aren't always caught. But in fact, uh, the questioner is asking why on this occasion did the trials uh, concentrate only on the bigger flies and not filter, filter down to other members uh, of the SS and the organization more generally. Uh, so I should say to all the panelists, you should come on the screen with your videos on and uh, I can then, if you put up your hand, also then turn to you after Philippe or somebody else has answered a question. Philippe, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Shifra. And can I also take the moment to just acknowledge Francine's contribution because I had written out and then skipped over my gratitude for her extraordinary work on um, the Soviet side is, it's absolutely right. I did not have that material available to me. And it is as it's seminal material. And I think on this question of the other trials that followed, and there were thousands and thousands, the Soviets played an absolutely central role in many of these trials across um, occupied Eastern Europe as it became. And perhaps she could say something about that. Regrettably, it's not just the privates who were, um, if you like, let go. Um, I, I wrote, uh, have written a, a sort of sequel to East West Street called The Rat Line, which tells one story. That is the story of um, Otto, Otto Wechter, who I mentioned, the deputy, if you like, one of the deputies of Hans Frank, governor of Krakow, constructed the Krakow ghetto, then was sent by Himmler and Hitler to District Galicia, based in Lemberg, Lviv, where he oversaw and contributed directly to the extermination of more than half a million people, for which he was indicted in 1945-46 by the Poles and the Americans. And in the rat line, and I didn't know anything about this, I when I came to know the son Horst, I was interested in the period up to 45, not what happened after 45. But in a nutshell, the story that I stumbled across, and um, Francine and Bill and others can say more about this, it became apparent that by 1948, whilst parts of the US and British um, were hunting Otto Wechter, other parts of the British and American uh, forces were seeking to recruit him. Um, and this is one of the big untold stories that by 90, late 46, early 47, as the Cold War uh, sort of honed into view, a new enemy emerged, the Soviets. It interfered with the end of the Nuremberg trial. It interfered with a great deal of things, but the British and the Americans begun to recruit high ranking Nazis, not privates, not low level folk, but serious mass murderers, and they did so knowing that they were mass murderers to recruit them for their Rolodexes. One of the chapters in the rat line is my conversation with my neighbor, the late great Irishman, John Le Carre, um, who obtained Irish nationality right at the end of his life, um, who described to me being in 
Kratz, at the time I was writing about, confused as a young British soldier being told to recruit Nazi mass murderers. Um, and I think there is a lot more to do on that story. It, 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 relatedly, and again, Francine perhaps can add something on this, some of the people they were <laughs> recruiting were also double agents for the Soviets. So basically, the application of international and domestic criminal justice became melded with the Cold War. Um, and I, I'd love to hear Francine uh, and her observations on any of these aspects. Thank you very much, Philippe. Before I uh, pass the floor to uh, Francine, and I think Francine, you're going to be in much demand in the next uh, 30 minutes of the Q&A. Uh, for the questioner, I would like to give an example of a very recent judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in a case called Gröning, Oscar Gröning against Germany. Now, some of you may know Oster Gröning because there's a Netflix documentary about him. It's called The Accountant of Auschwitz. And he was actually working on the ramp. He was the person who went through the belongings as people were coming off the train. And in a landmark decision of the Munich Regional Court in 2011, uh, the German uh, prosecutor started uh, indicting people who had contributed to the functioning of extermination camps. And this was to be classified as aiding and abetting murder. So they actually did start prosecuting members of the SS, lower down ranking figures in the whole story. The way in which these cases come to the European Court of Human Rights in 2020 is by means of length of proceedings challenges, basically because the length of proceedings have been so long. Mr. Grenning was first investigated in the early 70s and 80s then he acted as a witness. Then he was very prolific uh, in giving interviews to the British television, Der Spiegel. Uh, the investigation went quiet and then it was reactivated after this Munich court judgment. So there is uh, justice also, although it takes a long time, for lower down members of the organization. Now I pass to Francine and after Francine, I will ask a, a follow on question to Sandra Crosby. Um, also in relation to the recruitment of Nazi doctors and individuals involved in, in the trials afterwards. Francine, you have the floor. You have to unmute. Yes, okay. Um, so, so what I wanted to say in, in terms of how, so the organization's case, which was a huge part of the Nuremberg trials and something that I'll, I'll, it, it doesn't often get as much attention in our, in our, attempt, in our studies of, of Nuremberg, but you know, one of the reasons that the, the 22 defendants, or it should have been 24 initially, but one of the reasons each defendant was chosen was not just for the crimes that they had committed, but because they also represented a particular organization. And so the idea from the start was that Nuremberg would be the beginning and that there would be national trials that would follow afterwards based on the Nuremberg verdicts, including the verdicts on the organizations. Um, but there was also a, a lot of concern at the start about how wide this net should be cast. And that had to do in part with some of the earlier discussions from before the trial started. The Soviets had made it clear from the start that one of the reasons that they wanted an international tribunal was they wanted, they wanted forced laborers. They wanted what they talked about as labor reparations. And the British and the French were okay with that too. But when Jackson got involved, that was something that, that he, um, he really opposed this idea of labor reparations. And so, um, so, so as part of the deliberations and with the organization's case, there was a lot of effort, and this especially on the Americans' part, to figure out how to, um, again, how to define which members of an organization like the SS or the Gestapo could be held accountable. And, um, and I, I don't have all the specifics off the top of my head, but, but there were a whole number of categories of like, quote unquote, technical workers and, and people. So, so a whole number of things had to be proven in order for, um, so, so it wasn't going to be just collective guilt. It wouldn't be that you just find an organization guilty, but that there had to be subsequent trials. And even that general guilt of that organization would only apply to certain groups within that organization. And so then after Nuremberg, there were indeed a whole number of national trials held by, by the Soviets as, as well as by the British and the French and the Americans. Um, and, 
and there's, a, and there's still a lot we don't know. I mean, quite honestly, um, there are, are a number of scholars who are still really digging into those archives into the, and getting into the details of, of what happened with those. And I think especially with the Soviet ones, because it gets really complicated where, um, of course, in a number of the Soviet trials, they are trying um, Nazi perpetrators, but some of the Soviet trials turn political in, in other ways as well, where they're, they're using the trial to um, also to try to prosecute political people who are were, were not perpetrators. So, um, so, so I would just say that that there, um, there, there's still a lot to be done. And this question of double agents um, and all that is is fascinating. And um, I don't I don't know as, as much about that as I would like. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Francine. Uh, you've answered one part of Philippe's intervention, but I have a question from the audience which links into the other part, the post recruitment part. Uh, which comes from a member of the audience, they ask, could you comment on Harriet A. Washington's material regarding the American practice of employing former Nazi doctors long after the Nuremberg trials? And uh, the questioner refers to uh, recruitment by the OSS, the immediate forerunner of the CIA, uh, who recruited former Third Reich scientists, granting them immunity, jobs, and new identities in resettlement programs for Nazi scientists. You have the floor, Professor Crosby. Okay. So now this is a great question and kind of really a great um, principle to think about. Um, I'm not an expert on the radiation experiments that the US performed um, not only on hospitalized patients without consent, but children, pregnant women, um, military members, people in prisons. Um, and it just reminds me of what um, one of my colleagues here said, how do these big fish just kind of sweep through the, the spider web with, without um, any accountability? And um, th these experiments are just, you know, one example of other um, experimentation the US has um, involved in um, experimenting on veterans, the Tuskegee experiments, um, sterilization of um, women without consent. I mean, there are just many, many examples. And I guess, the, you know, the question for me is how, how does this happen and how does the U.S. repeatedly um, get away with this? Um, one of the, the arguments in the CIA black sites or, or one of the um, accusations um, for the CIA was that they were actually doing torture experiments on prisoners. So like measuring how long somebody could undergo waterboarding without dying or, you know, without having a cardiac arrest, et cetera. Um, you know, whether or not that's true, we'll probably have records, re you know, released in the future on that. Um, just as with the radiation experiments, I think it was not until the 90s that we actually um, had records released by the Department of Energy about that. But, you know, really the question is, how, how can um, strong countries, you know, get away with this and, and not have accountability? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's for one of my lawyer colleagues. Thank you very much uh, for your response. I'd like to bring Philippe back into the conversation before I field a more legal question uh, to Bill Chavez. And that is because uh, Sandra Crosby referred to this work uh, on psychology. Uh, how do you get a normal physician to become a torturer? And the, the theory of Robert J. Lifton was that you put them in atrocity producing situations. And he looked at a type of dissociation, which he called doubling. And that made me think of the closing uh, part of your book, uh, describing the last hours of Hans Frank. Uh, you explained very clearly that those on trial didn't accept a responsibility. He seemed to at one stage, but you question whether this wasn't simply as a, as literally a head saving exercise. But in the closing hours, he's talking to a priest and he describes feeling that this was another self. Um, and reading the book, I, I thought you were quite skeptical of this. So I was very struck by this part of Sandra's presentation. And I wonder if you'd like to comment. You have the floor. I just want to thank Sandra for her amazing presentation. I mean, she will know I've had a deep interest in what happened in Guantanamo. <laughs> I've written a whole book on the memo, the, the Rumsfeld memo of November 2002, and the appalling work of the lawyers in the Bush administration 
some of whom are now senior academics at fabulous universities around the world. I mean, you just couldn't invent it. <laughs> How do decent, smart, highly educated folk get embroiled in such horrors? I, I, I mean, different participants here will have their own theories on that. We're not, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychoanalyst, I, you know, but, but it's very clear to me that one of the common themes in all of the cases that I've done that involve mass atrocity is that people are able to do this when they can treat the victim, so to speak, as other. They are not human in the same way as us. That is the common theme in every single case. Now, how any of us might get to a place where we would be also able to do this is a question. I'm often asked, could I exclude any circumstance in which I, I would act in such a way? And I put my hand on my heart and I just say, I, I don't know, I hope not. But, you know, I look at the Franks and the Vechters they went to fabulous law schools. They were highly cultured, friends of Richard Strauss, great writers. How did they do it? it? It remains an enormous mystery. With regard to Frank himself, it's totally fascinating. I mean, Shifra, you understand as a judge better than anyone, you hear things in court and you know that everything has double, triple, quadruple meanings. You learn never to take things at face value. So in April, 1946, Frank gives this extraordinarily statement where he accepts the responsibility for what has happened, but only a collective responsibility. In other words, as a German who was part of a collective action, he becomes the only one of the defendants to acknowledge some degree of responsibility. And Yves Begbeder was in court that day and he remembers the excitement. Finally, one of the defendants acknowledged their responsibility. And Eve then dug up for me an article he wrote in a Catholic newspaper, a Swiss Catholic newspaper, um, describing how finally one of the defendants had acknowledged responsibility. But of course he hadn't really, because four months later in August, he has been leaned on by all the other defendants um, who've basically said to him, no German can ever speak in such a way, you've got to retract and retract he does. Uh, he says, I went too far. He never accepts individual responsibility. There's a very interesting uh, interplay here with the notions of genocide, the responsibility, the, the protection of the group, uh, crimes against humanity, the protection of the individual. Frank acknowledges a degree of collective responsibility, but cannot bring himself to accept individual responsibility until the last day of his life, mm -hmm. apparently. And some of you may have seen the film, the BBC documentary, My Nazi Legacy, where I interviewed Frank's son in one of the cells in the Nuremberg, uh, you know, there was a system of cells behind the courtroom, not open to the public, unfortunately, an amazing place. And I've known Nick Frank for 10 years. And for 10 years, it's just absolute hatred about his father, the worst criminal ever, deserved to be hanged, deserved terrible thing. Incidentally, Nick's book, The Father, will be published in Britain and Ireland for the first time mm -hmm. next month. And I hope you invite him to speak in Ireland because he's a remarkable human being. And then when he was in the cell of his father, or cell like the one in which his father was, suddenly he changed tone and he said, you know, maybe at that moment, as he faced his own death, Maybe then he acknowledged his responsibilities for what he had done. I don't know, said Nick, maybe he did. And this is the huge question, you know, to what extent a trial like Nuremberg really teases out a narrative that helps. I describe in East West Street this remarkable moment when the great writer Rebecca West goes to you know, for a wander outside Nuremberg and meets a bunch of Germans. And they all say, yeah, 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 it's a terrific trial and all of that, but it's a shame it's being run by the Jews. Um, and she says, well, what do you mean run by the Jews? Yes, David Maxwell Fife, he's called David, he must be a Jew. And, you know, all, there are narratives and double narratives in all of the stories. And every major international trial has unintended consequences. And we don't, know what they are all in relation to Nuremberg. I'd like to pass the floor to Bill, who has had his virtual hand up for some time, and I think would like to 
uh, connect back to something that Francine and Philippe were speaking about earlier. But could I also invite you, Bill, to address uh, the following topic. Philippe has often said that in the field of international criminal justice, all roads lead to Nuremberg. But in the field of international human rights, the question is, do all roads not also, or many roads not also lead to Nuremberg? So Bill, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Shifa. Well, I do think that uh, Nuremberg plays a very, uh, a very significant role in uh, international human rights law as well. And I mean, we're still debating the origins of human rights and there are different theories about that. Sam Moyne has written about how it all begins in the 1970s. Other people have a narrative about Eleanor Roosevelt and René Cassin being at the origin of it. The work I've been doing in the recent months uh, has been studying the, the, the un, largely unwritten story about how people of the global south contributed to human rights in the very earliest years of the United Nations. And most of the activity in, um, in 1946 in the United General, Nations General Assembly on, in the area of human rights came from countries like India and Egypt and even, imagine this, Saudi Arabia. So there was a there, there's, there's, there are a lot of sources of, of human rights. The, the point that I wanted to go back to was about these uh, minor offenders. And I think that most of them were actually prosecuted in Germany. It said that in Germany, they held something like 50,000 trials. It, they, they're still going on. I think maybe they've hit the end now just because of human longevity. The idea of trying the major criminals at Nuremberg goes back to the Moscow Declaration, which was uh, made at the beginning of November 43, when the Allies said, the Declaration said that they would hold the, uh, the Germans accountable in the places where the crimes took place, that is by the national courts, and they would reserve the judgment of the major criminals to be decided later. And uh, the Americans and the, above all the Soviets, as Francine has pointed out, started thinking, well, we better figure out how we're gonna try them. The British went off and said, well, we're not gonna have a trial, we're gonna execute them summarily. Uh, maybe that doesn't shock an Irish audience to hear that about the British, but I just, I've been through the archives in, uh, in uh, Kew Gardens of the British files on this, and the bureaucrats in the foreign office were preparing hit lists, basically, and there's a whole documentation of it, of the people they were planning to murder, essentially. When, when they captured them. And they had a whole list of them uh, and they were ranked. Um, there were debates about who belonged on the list. So the, the foreign office bureaucrats thought that the businessmen shouldn't be on there, the bankers and those people. And Clement Attlee, the leader of the Labour Party, who was a good socialist said, no, you have to put the capitalists back on the list because we're gonna execute them as well. This, this issue you've just been discussing about, about recognition, contrition, whatever we call it. It's a pity they were executed. If they, maybe we would have known more about, about whether they changed their minds and what they thought if we'd left them alive. And we could see maybe that we would have, we, and, and certainly we, problem was the execution just cut that off, made it impossible to know further what they were thinking, but that was the way it was done in the day. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Before I hand the floor to Jeff Roberts, who has a, a series of his historical questions, which I think will be clearer if he poses them himself, I do have a question uh, for Philippe, which perhaps the others might like to uh, also intervene on. During the course of the book, there is a, a constant tension, I think, in your writing between Lauterpacht and Lemkin, both as characters and then as what they represent in law, individual rights versus group rights. And you appear during the course of the journey to be very much in the Lauterpacht camp, at least in legal terms. Um, but towards the end and in your intervention today, there was a considerable amount of, of support and sympathy, I thought, for the development of genocide and what it has successfully achieved. Although I should say, dealing with some of the cases that I deal with, and we deal with obviously mostly individual right applications, but also we have dealt with in the past and are dealing with extremely difficult interstate cases. Um, the point you make about group rights, that approach that it can have the, the opposite effect to that which it seeks to achieve, I think is a very valid one. So Philippe, uh, Lauterberg versus Lemkin, individual rights versus group rights. 
Well, if I had to have dinner or a beer with one of them, it would undoubtedly be Lemkin. I think he would be the far more entertaining companion from everything that I've told, although I am told that Lao Pat had a terrific sense of humour, but didn't display it very often. Um, but, you know, Bill and I can talk about this for ages. Um, I am sceptical about the concept of genocide as it has been adopted in the convention. Um, I think Lao Pat was essentially right that it has reified the idea of the group in international society. It has engendered, by the way it's been applied by international courts, it has engendered further hatreds. Um, I think, for example, of the Yugoslav context, you know, one act of killing is characterized as a genocide, another act of killing is only a crime against humanity, and this engenders terribly negative feelings. So I'm very torn about this. I end East-West Street absolutely um, understanding what Lemkin has done and the rationale of his position, that people almost inevitably get mass murdered because they happen to be a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time and place. And I think he's right about that and therefore he is right that the law must respect that and reflect that reality. On the other hand I think Lauter Pact is right too that we have replaced the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the groups and it has played in to senses of identity politics and I worry um, very greatly about that. My approach to dealing with that which won't happen would be to meld the concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide. Um, I don't think the killing of 100,000 people as a crime against humanity is less terrible than the killing of 100,000 people as a crime of genocide. And yet if an American president witters on about a crime against humanity taking place somewhere in the world, no one pays the blindest bit of attention. But if he utters the genocide word, everyone comes running and it's on the first pages of the newspapers. We got this two and a half weeks ago when President Biden for the first time for an American president characterized what had happened in 1915 in relation to the Armenians as a genocide. And it was literally in every newspaper in the world. So what is it about this word genocide? And of course there is a disconnect between public understandings of what genocide means. The public perception is it just means treating lots of people horribly and the legal definition. And I think the legal definition is deeply problematic I have tried on numerous occasions, often in arguments against Bill, uh, to get international courts to lower the bar. I have failed miserably. He has succeeded magnificently. But I think the courts have got it wrong because I think they've elevated genocide to a place um, in which you get the absurdity of a situation in which the killing of 8,000 people in Srebrenica is commemorated around the world because an international court has called it a genocide, but the killing of up to 3 million people in the Democratic Republic of Congo is passed in silence because it's only treated as a war crime or a crime against humanity. What is the social utility of that approach? Why do we elevate particular groups to particular degrees of commemoration? I, I think it's extremely unhelpful, but I'm at this point on the losing side of the argument. I should say, that on the ecocide work, interestingly, the Stop Ecocide NGO Foundation has done um, sort of public polls on what to call the crime of massive damage to the environment. And it's very interesting. If you call it sort of environmental crime against humanity, everyone yawns and no one cares and uh, no one says anything. But if you call it ecocide, everyone goes, oh, yes, I'm in favor of that. That's really important. That's really terrible. So there is some magic to the word that Lemkin invented. And I think the question that's interesting, and Bill may have his own answer to it, is, is the magic the word itself? Nowhere is more literary in the world, in my experience, than Ireland. I mean, there are no book festivals are more fun to go to than the Irish ones, because the, the readers are so extraordinary. And did Lemkin do something in coining this word that opened up the imagination? Or is it that the concept has a connection to our own individual sense of identity with groups. And just as I find myself at a mass grave with the Lauterpacht family and my grandfather's family, I'm unable to resist the power of Lemkin's work. What is it? I don't know, Bill, maybe you've got other ideas. 
and maybe others amongst the panelists have ideas of why we reify genocide in ways that we don't other concepts. Thank you very much. I must say, uh, hats off to Bill, because after listening to those pleadings on the need to lower the threshold, uh, Bill must have done quite a job to win on each occasion. Uh, I haven't given the floor yet to James, but that's partly because I think James and myself have the least freedom of expression on a panel of this nature, given that we speak in a personal capacity, but nevertheless, uh, very much with the attachment of our respective organizations in the background. However, uh, before I give the floor to Jeff, uh, he's going to pose a question uh, of a historical nature, probably to Francine. James, would you like to comment on anything that has been said by the other panel members? Oh, thanks, Shifra. And look, at, I mean, there are far greater experts as well uh, in, in legal issues uh, with, with, with Philippe and, and Bill, not to mention yourself. But I mean, I think it's true to say in Ireland particularly, words create reality as well as being the result of reality. Um, and, and genocide is now a word that has resonance for all that you can criticize it, it can't be put back in the bottle. Um, and we just have to use it and temper it in such a way that it's not, it's, it's the all or nothing thing, uh, 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 you know, uh, as Philippe has said, and, and something can be really terrible without being genocide, but the word has a power and a resonance and it helps to galvanize, if it helps to galvanize public opinion appropriately to save lives, I guess, or to punish perpetrators, well then it does, it does have a value. Thank you very much, James. I pass the floor to Jeff. We have time for just one more question. Uh, Jeff, you have the floor. Uh, actually, I'm going to ask a question of James um, rather than the historical question. Uh, let me just say first, I, I, fabulous conversation, fabulous panel, uh, completely exceeded uh, all my expectations. Um, let me just comment on this question about, uh, you know, how could these people do it? How could Frank you know, be responsible for the Holocaust in Poland? How could they actually do it? Well, look, the, the main historical character you know, I deal with is, is Stalin. You know? People always question, well, how could he do it? How could he preside over this mass murderous, terrible regime? And you know, the answer to that question quite often comes in the form of some kind of psychological theory of one kind or another, just like the theories we've been dis discussing here in relation to Frank and, and others. In, in my, my conclusion in relation to that question uh, uh, you know, is, is basically this, is that you know, Stalin wasn't um, a, psych, uh, you know, a psychopath, uh, he wasn't a monster, he didn't have a bloodlust. Um, what he was, was um, an, an intellectual actually, an idealist and utopian, who invested a huge amount of emotional force in his beliefs. Right, and and in the consequences of those beliefs in terms of action. So that's how Stalin could live with himself. Not just that he believed what he was doing was right and the cost he was extracting for his utopian goals were correct, but he actually felt that as well. So, so that's my kind of take on that question. Okay, my question to, to James is a kind of um, you know a, a rather sharp question. When maybe he won't be won't be able to answer it. Won't want to answer it. Which is this? Okay, you have like small states like Ireland, uh, you know making all these demands in relation to, you know, getting rid of the UN security veto, adopting this convention on human rights, having this accountability. Generally, accountability demands from a small state, which has no power, doesn't have a huge amount of involvement in international affairs, at least not at the sharp end of it, demanding on large states to be accountable when it, it itself is never ever going to be held accountable for anything of that character because it never does anything. So how is it realistic to really expect that these demands uh, that you outlined in your presentation are going to be met uh, from small states, essentially, powerless states, are going to be met by big states? How realistic is, are those prospects? I said it was a sharp question. Sure, and I mean, it's an interesting question, and it's a question that's, I guess, been asked before. I mean, one thing to bear in mind, uh, Philippe mentioned John le Carre being an Irish citizen. Irish citizens get everywhere. There are very many people very high up in British society. I've mentioned a couple of them, you know, judges and so on. But, you know, Irish people were very prominent in the British Armed Forces, for example. Uh, Amritsar Massacre, there's a connection to County Cork. Um, and in, in current days, uh, Irish people are extremely powerful, both in the Biden administration, also in the Trump administration. So we get everywhere. So uh, under the International Criminal Court jurisdiction, Ireland has jurisdiction over Irish nationals 
wherever they are located and whoever they work for. So it's not completely uh, at the Shannon, the whole debate about Shannon Airport. We sometimes are faced with very sharp questions. But the whole premise of Irish diplomacy and Irish nationhood, in fact, is that small states working together are powerful. We each individually have very little power, but we're part of an international system whereby all states are formally equal. We're not equally powerful, but we can work collectively to hold each other to account. Um, and that's why every 20 years or so, we offer ourselves for election as members of the Security Council and are chosen by our peers as members of the Security Council so that we can play a role, a modest role in making international law, the rule of law, uh, work in such a way that it improves international relations and the life of citizens all around the world. If that's not too, too, uh, I don't know, general an answer to your, your very pointed and, and particular question, thanks. Thank you very much, James. Indeed, I could recommend the viewing of a, a speech in the European Parliament by a former Taoiseach on that precise subject in the context of Brexit. Uh, we come to the end of our panel session and I have uh, to give huge thanks to all the members of the panel, to Philippe for his wonderful presentation uh, of subjects and I watched in awe uh, as he simply uh, surfed from one to the next uh, without notes and uh, I very much look forward to someday uh, meeting you in person. Uh, thank you also to all the panelists. I am a judge's judge and a lawyer to my core, and therefore the task of chairing a multidisciplinary panel uh, was somewhat out of my normal comfort zone, but you made my job extremely easy. I'd also like to thank the audience. I hope we have uh, represented some of your questions as best we could. We've avoided the worst of uh, Chinese whispers, which is what I have experienced in the past on webinars as a speaker, when the question fed to me actually didn't make very much sense by the time it got to me. So I hope that it was easy for both the chair and the audience to follow. Uh, and I end with my really firm and warm thanks to the Royal Irish Academy, uh, to Jeff Roberts, who introduced the session today, previously to Pauline McNamara, to the wonderful uh, Vanessa Carswell, uh, Sharon O'Connor and to Gronia for all their help. Uh, I can say in the preparatory session that on the panel there are many experts, but there aren't many techies. So without the wonderful support of the Royal Irish Academy, I think many things could have gone wrong this evening. Uh, thank you to everybody. And uh, I look forward to meeting you again. And of course, I think Philippe has mentioned the unveiling of Jean Le Carré as an Irish uh, national. It's something which was received with great interest and enthusiasm uh, by his Irish readers and even those who don't read his book. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.